Rodney Diaz, uh, otolaryngologist, board member. Debbie Snow, public member, board member. Debbie Snow, public member, board member. Patty Solomon-Rice, <coughs> Solomon speech-language pathologist, board member. Dee Parker, speech-language pathologist, board chair. Paul Sanchez, executive officer of the board. Kelsey Pruden, DCA legal. Marsha Raggio, audiologist board member. Christy Cooper, audiologist board member. Amnon Shalev, hearing a dispenser board member. We do have a quorum. At this time, if any members who are in the audience would like to give us their name, we welcome you, but you're not obligated. Uh, Brianne Humphrey, Operations Manager for the Board. Amy White, uh, California Academy of Audiology, Legislative Liaison. Christine Fromm, California Academy of Audiology, President. Katrina Martinez, Board Staff. Heather Olivares, Board Staff. Sean Green, Director of School-Based Services with the Chief Pathology Group. Caitlin Jung, um, Legislative Advocate for the California Speech and Language Learning Association. Jackie Georgeson, Director of Clinical Education and Training for the University of the Pacific's Acrobiology Program. Rupa Balachandran, Chair of the Doctor of Audiology Program, University of the Pacific. Vanessa Hina on behalf of the Hearing Health Care Providers of California. Uh, Joe Bartlett, uh, President of Hearing Health Care uh, Health Care Providers of California. <coughs> Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to uh, announce our new member. She is our new audiologist, and this is Dr. Christy Cooper. Welcome, Christy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now we will move to the approval of the minutes from the August 9th and 10th, 2018 meeting. As always, any edits can be forwarded to board staff. If you have any sub anything yeah. substantive at this time that you need to discuss. I have a comment uh, on on the minutes. I relate my comments only to the part I was there, not the, the other issues. So the part I was there is in page uh, six and seven. Um, on the discussion of possible action regarding, s uh, no, 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 no. Where's the 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 part that we discuss? This is regarding the part that we discuss the uh, examination. Uh, uh, except uh, to, exa to the examination, uh, the practical examination of a biologist. Which page is this? That's on page two. Page two. Oh, okay. Page two. Yeah, page two and three. So, uh, Kelsey, I understand you do the the notes. No. No. Okay. So whoever done the notes, detailed the whole discussion with a lot of details, but they didn't put something that was mentioned and asked by me at least a couple of times, two or three times, because I went over. We have the recording on the web is regarding my question, what is the pass-fail rate of, in a practical examiner or audiologist? And one time the people from the office said it's 90% pass, and again when it was asked it was 
uh, high 80 to 90, but there was no definite number. And the whole discussion about the pass rate number does not appear in the minutes. Okay, we can, we can include that in the okay. revised version. Again, uh, Joe Barlett from Aaron Healthcare Providers of California. Uh, in section 12 uh, on page, let's see, paragraph 3, um, there's a conversa conversation between myself and Ms. Raggio uh, that was in depth uh, discussing the uh, audiology and masking. Um, I do believe that that was, is pertinent to some of the further conversations that we have. Um, it was, it's, not, it's, it's not mentioned in this at all, but there was a question and answer between she and I regarding um, uh, the masking candidacy and also the uh, grasp of, audio, of masking for audiologists as well as uh, uh, some audiologists. So you're referring to page, you're referring to page seven, the second paragraph, correct? Oh. Section 12 of the, which would be on page seven? Of, of the minutes. Of, of the minutes itself, sorry, oh, sorry, of the entire agenda, I apologize. Let's see here. I wrote it down so I wasn't, not, remember. The discussion of possible action regarding supervision trainee, so page, page uh, seven. Um, oh, this is printed a little differently, so I apologize. Uh, paragraph two on that, on page seven. Finishing a small paragraph, it'd be paragraph two, but that's paragraph three towards the end. It speaks of our of uh, back and forth, but there was further um, direct um, statements and answers to questions that I think should be in the the minutes. So the section. So I see a reference to masking mm -hmm. in the paragraph. Yep, that needs to be expanded upon. Okay. Because I was asked direct questions and direct answers, and Ms. Raggio also. Uh, made uh, statements to the same. Is there anything specific that you uh, the point statement out that was needs to that, that she's aware of, of audiologists that don't have a firm grasp of masking? Okay. Thank you. Can you please come to the microphone? I just wanted to add to the gentleman's comments or modify for it to stay Dr. Raju and not Ms. Raju. I think it's important. to accept minutes with um, uh, addenda as requested by Anna. A second. It's been moved and seconded. We'll call the roll. Ron? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I'll vote present just because I was not in the second day of the meeting. Okay. So, it, so you're abstaining? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And the minutes are accepted. Are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? 
for future. Good afternoon. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I just have a couple brief comments. I first want to say thank you to the licensing board and to the staff for all the tedious work you all are doing in helping to protect consumers and in helping to continue to provide ethical and research-based practice in the field of speech therapy and, audi and audiology. Some concerns that we've had this past year really revolve around licensing paperwork and the amount of time it's taking to process that. We've noticed that it's really increased this year, particularly with foreign educated applicants. We currently have an applicant where it's taking almost four months to process the license. And during that time, students aren't being served. So we just wanted to share that and we hope that we can kind of help with the process, whether that's bringing on more staff or improving technology, because it's really impacting services to students. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Then we'll move on to item number four. If you go to tab four in your materials, um, you'll see my memorandum regarding the discussion of possible action regarding the board's prior action on the examination requirement for dispensing audiologists. There's some background information there, but this discussion revolves around the board's previous action on August 9th to accept the recommendations um, that OPS made regarding removing the hearing aid dispenser practical exam requirement for dispensing audiologists and directing staff to work with legal and OPS to draft regulatory language to implement this change and bring it to the board to the next meeting. Um, Amnon Shalev has raised concerns regarding the board's motion and would like a further discussion and for the board to, to reconsider this motion. We have some options um, or different things that can happen based on where the board goes. So at this time, um, we can allow Amnon to, to discuss yeah. his issues and concerns. Yes, uh, I would like the, the, this issue that to my opinion, is very critical in our profession uh, from a point of view of public safety. It's taking an ear mold impression. And I think we should fully deliberate it as much as we can before coming to the end conclusion. And I think that for this purpose, uh, I, I was one of the people who were involved in creating the this board in 2009, eventually came to fruition in 2010, and when the legislator uh, wrote the regulation about this board, they put one committee, they didn't put a theology committee or speech therapy committee, there was one committee hearing a dispenser committee, which has to deal with all aspects of fitting and selling hearing aids. And I think that this committee should have uh, the time and the opportunity to discuss this issue uh, based on the recommendation of uh, occupational analysis and then give its recommendation to the full board to have a final decision. So I found out that in order to do this, since the board already voted to accept the language, there has to be a vote on reconsideration of the previous vote so it will be another opportunity to put a motion to move the issue to the hearing and dispensing committee. So with this I said that I uh, move to reconsider the previous uh, motion uh, that was adopted on uh, August 9 so we can move the item to the hearing and dispensing committee. Well, 
Amnon's made a motion, and yeah. I guess Maybe. we would entertain a second at this point. Oh, yeah. okay, I'll second it then. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion from members of the board? I think it's a reasonable suggestion. I think it's absolutely fine. What part of the suggestion? The suggestion to have a discussion in the hearing and discuss in committee level and then have the committee um, come forward with suggestions for the full board. So if I might, I, um, I would recommend that the board first uh, entertain whether or not they want to reconsider it as a whole. Okay. Um, because an action has already been taken. The, board, the full board did vote on it and take action. Um, and then to have the discussion as to oh. what to do with it next. Um, it, you don't have to handle it that way, but um, in, in my opinion, I think that might be the cleanest way. So Amnon, if you're okay with that. Um, yeah. the, I know that you added the part about the hearing aid dispenser committee, but for purposes of this motion, just to reconsider it. Yeah, so I move oh. just to reconsider oh. the previous motion. Can I just ask, just verify who's on the um, hearing aid dispensers committee? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are two hearing aid dispensers, two dispensing audiologists, the physician, and one public member, six members. Okay, so that is Rod So Yeah, we have five of, out of the six present right now. Right. But Brian, am I correct that there are, everyone's on the committee with the exception of two people? I believe so. Okay, so one public member and one speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. So there's no public member on? There's, there's one public member. Technically, two public two members, two. one of yes, them physician. Sorry, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. So almost the entire board with the exception yeah. of one speech language pathologist and one. No, with, with the except of the and two speech with the exception of the two speech pathologists. Okay. And with the exception of one public member. Now, and, and just kind of my own background, this is Paul's background on what committees are for and how they're formed. Um, typically, when a board takes on another licensing type, a lot of times the larger licensing type issues will swallow up all of the time. Um, for instance, you, have, you may have a professional license and you may have an assistant. The assistants may come up and say, well, our issues are never heard. And they raise those issues to the legislature. So the legislature mandates, you know, we need to have a committee comprised of this assistant type category so that those issues are heard by the board. I've actually been a part of boards where those issues were not heard and these committees were established. So that's why you typically have these legislative mandated committees. And I believe that was the intent of creating the Hearing Aid Dispensers Committee. In our case, I, I don't know. Uh, by, by the way, before I continue, I want to make sure that everybody uh, gets a handout. So we have two handouts on this item. One is the uh, table that has first time statistics for the practical exam by audiologists. And the second is a November 27th letter from hearing health care providers uh, that we just received. And some of the issues that we're discussing are covered in that letter. But just, I just want to touch on the point that I don't see, based on, at least since I've been here, that we have ignored hearing aid dispenser issues. On the contrary, I think that we've covered them, we've talked about them. And I just want to make sure that that's clear to everyone, that it seems like we are talking about hearing aid dispensing issues. And, and I, I've also solicited input and feedback on a regular basis from hearing health care providers and, and those are out there and we've held meetings so I, I think that while we may not meet, we may not have met with the hearing aid dispensers committee on this issue, it's because the board saw this as an audiology licensing issue and not a hearing aid dispenser licensing issue. I think that was the decision of the board but to the extent that we've gotten input from the whole board and the hearing aid dispensers, that opportunity has been provided. Um, you said pretty much everything I was about to say, so I appreciate you explaining that very uh, eloquently, Paul. Uh, so basically, um, my, my thoughts are that at the last meeting, uh, OPS uh, presented a very uh, thoughtful 
analysis of the uh, of the examination and, and uh, really gave us their uh, final input on what they felt was uh, uh, what their recommendations were. And I thought that the board as a whole uh, had a chance to make a recommend or make a decision. Uh, and the hearing aid committee, uh, which as you mentioned is most of the board. Um, really probably would make the same decision. I, I, I asked at that time uh, when we might potentially get our second hearing aid dispenser uh, member to the board and there wasn't really a uh, sense of when we might be able to get that. And uh, not knowing when we might be able to get that member, not knowing when we would have an opportunity to uh, you know, get that further input, it seemed prudent not to just basically make a decision with the, the majority of the hearing aid committee and, and the full board present at that time. So I don't feel like my uh, my decision would change at this point. So it looks like the motion carried five to one. I assume the one is the abstaining. Is that sure? It would it would be the abstaining. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Do I read that right? Yes. It would, yeah, it would be five zero one. Should actually okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess since that was the case that the majority of the um, board members voted to accept um, their recommendation, I guess I'd like to, if there's someone who currently disagrees with that, who's changed their mind, so to speak, since that vote, um, I guess I'd like to hear if that is the case and what is what are their contentions now. I think that we have one right now in front of my eyes, a difference between the information that was presented by the Office of Occupational Analysis. I right now, we got a table that says that 19% failure, almost 20% failure. Yeah, but let me Is just it clear, right? Yeah, just, just for clarification purposes, the question that was asked at the last board meeting was what was the passing rate for audiologists? The passing rate is in the ninety percent in the ninety percent range. It's actually more than ninety percent. It's higher. This table was provided. Um, Am Amnonshul have requested that we go back three years and look at the passing rate for first time takers. So if you look at if you look at this table, yeah. we've broken it down by date. The yeah. number of audiologists that are licensed in California, the number of audiologists that are licensed out of state the total number that have taken it for the first time and the total number that passed the first time. And, and that's correct, I'm not, that number is 81%. But this is not the same number that was provided. It's looked to me from this table, just by looking, I didn't make the calculation, that the best year of passage was in 2016. If you go for 17 and 18, it's worse even. It's worse than 81 passage because the best year was 2016. I always have trouble with these percentages because sometimes they represent only a couple of people having taken it. No, this is the like total a, people. This no, I know, table is I know, the total people. But that's the problem with percentages though, a small number, small ends here. Um, if two people take it and one people person fails, that's a 50 percent I know, fail. but if 131 people take it and 106 fail, we have a number. That, that's well, probably why it's good. Uh, it's passed, so. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. that's why we made a point to look at the whole number, because a lot yeah. of times we'll come to the board meetings and just the way our table is formatted, if four people take it and, you know, three pass and one fail, then we say there's a 75 percent pass rate. So I think what we're trying to do here is we're trying to show you a whole number. I think this is a very real number. This is a number that represents three years, and it's saying exactly that, that 81% of the people that take it for the first time pass. Yeah. And I, 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 and I think I, that's all it's saying. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's shocking that to say, it's okay for us. 20% failure, it's okay with us. It's like a DMV office will come and say 20 people, 20% failing the driving test. We don't need a driving test. 20% is okay. That's hard for me to, to take, you know? And it's not 20% people failing on how to present the hearing aid or how to do 
a test, this is 20% of fail on the most critical issue. That's why I think we need a discussion again. Are these and people I'm who fail just the ear impression portion? No. no. And that, that's, a, that's a very good comment to make. I know Tracy has a comment. Please come forward, Tracy. But I, I, I want to make it very clear that this is not saying that those people that failed could not produce an air mold impression, which has been one of the board's um, major issues. This is simply giving you the pass rate for those that have taken it for the first time. I have some personal experiences. I would be more than happy to share I, um, if we want to go into those discussions. But there are lots of variables in the exam. Um, lots of variables are. Even this, um, when I first spoke to Amron about this, we were only looking at, I think at the time, uh, 16 to 18 months. Um, I know Amron, you wanted to see three years, and one of the explanations, uh, or one of the responses I gave him, was that looking back three years is kind of comparing apples to oranges because the exam has changed over the years. Um, there is a portion of the exam, for example, well, I won't get into the discussion of the exam because I know Tracy's going to chastise me for doing that, but we'll just, uh, we'll, I'll allow Tracy to make her comment. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tracy Montez uh, with DCA Programs and Policy Review. Um, OPS is one of the units in my division. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. First of all, that pass rate, we're very comfortable with it because we know, uh, first of all, no exam is perfect and we don't have any of our programs that have 100% pass rate. Our psychologists, our dentists, things like that, somebody's going to fail. You know, there, there's some error in the exam. Um, so we try to control as much error. Sometimes it is because the individual is not competent to practice and sometimes it's anxiety and other things like that. But with regard to uh, this particular exam, I want to remind you that it's developed primarily towards the hearing aid dispensing profession. And so you have your hearing aid uh, dispensing profession that has to have a high school uh, uh, diploma and be 18 years, and then you have your audiologist that have um, many more other criteria for becoming licensed. And sometimes when you have the advanced degrees, the supervised hours and so forth, that can work against you, especially if you're taking an exam that is developed for a different type of profession. Yes, there's the overlap, but that sometimes can introduce some error into the process. So I wanted to reassure you that we're very comfortable with the data that Paul's provided to you, as well as the data that we provided um, back in August. We haven't changed our opinion um, of, of our recommendation for the process. Thank you. Here, I, I want to show that there is inconsistency with the way we're thinking about this examination and the safety issue. Uh, in, the, in, in the regulations, a, li a, a licensed hearing a dispenser in another state, a licensed hearing a dispenser in another state, that shows th with his application that for the last two years, he actively working in this profession come to the California and apply for, for a license. California will tell him, you can work here for one year without supervision, doing dispensing here yet, but at the end of this year, you must go and have the practical test. So this hearing a dispenser that done hundreds of impressions in other states, make hundreds of impressions in the state here, still still need to come for the practical test if you want to continue. And we take an audiology that either came from school and we don't need him a test, or an audiology that got his degree 20, 30 years ago and never dispensed in his life and never done impression in his life and he can be exempt from examination while hearing a dispenser that done hundreds of impressions suddenly needs to go for examination. So, so I don't think this is, we, we, we treat equal. And this is, a, again, safety issue. That's what I'm saying. That's why we require from dispenser to go eventually and do the test. And now there's uh, in a profession in Kaiser in Southern California, uh, they don't do hearing aids in, they refer all their retail 
to another outside company. Not that they don't do airing yet, they don't do swim plugs, they don't know anything. Furthermore, they don't have hearing aid impression material in their audiology department in Kaiser in Southern California. So there's a lot of audiologists that have different, an academy or hospital that don't do hearing aid impressions. And so I, I, don't, th I don't know why we are in 131 people in three years that apply and we are, why we can't see that they can come once in a lifetime for the test. I think if we, I, I understand that audiology spend a lot of time and money being educated for, for, for six years before he got his degree and he has a lot of expense and he wants to work. Why don't they treat him like outside uh, audiology, uh, outside dispenser from another state that they will work on a temporary license for a year, but then at the end of the year they have to go to the practical test. So that's not a burden. They'll be able to work out of school for a year like, they are, like dispensers, and then they will have to go and come and do the test. May I make a comment? Amy White, Kaiser Health System. Um, not uh, to repeat all the arguments, I mean, saw the um, meeting from last time, so don't want to repeat, except to again bring up the point that audiologists can and will and do ear mold impressions all the time without being dispensing audiologists, as that is well within the scope of practice and is consistently performed by non-dispensing audiologists. So that two things don't relate. The other is the concern that I think by merging all the boards together, it almost gives the um, appearance that audiologists are the same as hearing aid dispensers and we are not and I think that that is really the key point from all the research that was done is that audiologists are different than hearing aid dispensers and we don't need to be tested the same and shouldn't be treated the same because we are not the same and if we need extra testing that would be one thing but that the current test is not one that was developed or meant for audiologists. It was developed and meant for dispensers. So if this was going to be considered further, I don't understand why the hearing aid dispensing committee would be the one discussing it. It should then fall under the audiology practices committee because it's regarding audiology licensure. Yeah. There, is, there is no audiology committee, but say, I, I, let me tell, explain to you one thing. Yes, yes, when, yes, yes, when, yes. For the purpose of taking an ear mold impression, for the purpose of taking ear mold impression, it's identical, a hearing aid dispenser, high school graduate, and a doctor of audiology, six years of university, when they take the ear mold impression, at that moment, it's 100% identical. Nothing to do with all the education. So I'm talking only on this specific procedure, taking an ear mold impression. Not sure just, I just that. a quick point, uh, just a point of order, please. Um, I'm going to ask that the chair call on individuals so that we're not just having a back and forth discourse. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jackie Jerson, um, University of Pacific AED program. Um, I just wanted to clarify with regards to um, Kaiser in Southern California. Um, I know that audiologists there who are non dispensing because they don't dispense hearing aids um, are do take impressions, ear mold impressions. Um, it is within their scope of practice and, and, and um, they are able to do that. And I know that because I've placed students at Kaiser in Southern California and the students have had the opportunity to take impressions. Um, that also, um, in not just Kaiser Southern California, um, pediatric hospitals as well, there are many um, pediatric hospitals that do not have dispensing audiologists. They don't dispense the hearing aids, but they will do all of the fitting and the follow-up on them. And so the audiologists are not dispensing audiologists, but they absolutely will take ear mold impressions, ear impressions for swim plugs or other um, um, devices to hold the canal open or stuff like that. So because it is within, as Amy was saying, it, it is in, within the scope of practice of an audiologist, um, and 
audiologists do perform them regardless of if they have taken the hearing aid dispensing exam. It might not be taking a numeral <coughs> depression for fitting a hearing aid. It might be for something else, but they do take a numeral depression. Kelsey, 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 Kelsey had a comment. So I just wanted to clarify for the board um, what your statutes say regarding um, dispensing audiologists. And the first is that um, it is within the scope to sell hearing aids. However, in California, um, it, it is under, um, it's 2530.2K, and it's the very last sentence. It says that um, the practice of audiology means dot, 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 um, but not limited, or but not limited to specifying application requirements and evaluation of the results thereof, auditory training and speech reading, and the selling of hearing aids. However, in the state of California, it goes on to say that no licensed audiologist shall, shall sell hearing aids unless she or he or she completes an application for a dispensing audiology license, pays all the applicable fees, and passes an examination approved by the board related to the selling of hearing aids. So I did just want to point out that the fitting part, the fitting and selling, which is in the definition of hearing aid dispensing, is not included in this particular statute. And I'm happy to clarify any further if board members have questions on that. Uh, I would like Maybe. to answer. Okay. Woodland Hills, Kaiser and Woodland Hills, audiologist Carrie Ritchie worked for us many years ago. She's now working for Kaiser and Woodland Hills. She told me that they don't have, and there are three or four uh, audiologists working there. They don't have even an ear mold impression. They are not doing nothing. You can verify it, you can call Kaiser Woodland Hills. Um, I, so oh. I can speak for Kaiser in San Diego. So okay. the Kaiser San Diego area, Woodland Hills, I did not place a student mm -hmm. there, so I cannot speak to Kaiser Woodland Hills. So I can speak to Kaiser San Diego. Yeah. Okay, so, ju just, a, so just a point of clarification. I think we, whether Kaiser allows it or not, I think we've already established what's in the Practice Act. So I think we have more comments from Vanessa Jones. Thank you, Vanessa Kahina, on behalf of the hearing health care providers. Uh, we appreciate Mr. Shalev's comments and the motion that he made to bring this back to the Hearing Aid Dispensers Committee. Um, if you start to really look through and go through this, taking away the practical exam, at that point, at, at what point is the erosion between a dispensing audiologist and a non-dispensing audiologist? This is ultimately an issue about fitting and selling hearing aids and having to demonstrate, even for a small number of people on a quarterly basis, that they're able to do that in a safe way. Uh, for that reason, we think it should go back to the Hearing Aid Dispenser Committee. We appreciate your time and your comments, and we've elucidated more in the letter that we sent to you. And then in terms of the exam and what we can and can't talk about here, that's also a good discussion to have under the auspices of that committee. I wanted to, again, thank you for even hearing this again. Oh, hello. Thank you for hearing this, uh, some of this again today. Uh, I, I know uh, uh, Mr. Shalev has, has brought up a lot when it comes to your impressions, but the fitting and selling hearing aids is not just making ear impressions. The hearing aids can create uh, upwards of 130 decibels, and if not fit correctly by somebody who understands what they're doing, you can create immediate damage to someone's hearing. So we're not talking about ear impressions is one thing, and we, we really kind of rode that, I think, to the ground at this point in time. But uh, the process of quality control in, for the consumers of California, that's what this test is all about. And the national test covers audiology, and a, a portion of that is hearing aids. But I, I pose a question, I don't know the, the answer to it, could somebody walk away with an audiology degree and do poorly in hearing aids on a national exam? And then now they come to California and they are free to do all of that, working with devices that have that sort of capacity. I mean, this is for, again, the test is for consumers in California. That's the idea. So um, the other question that I had was, if we have portions of, of dispensing, when it comes to even creating the proper test or creating the proper verification, that we have issues with um, not having firm grasp of the ability to do a test, uh, there's an issue when it comes to doing a fitting also. It all starts from that. And we are using that test as there for quality control for consumers in California. So thank you for my statement. Can, can I just make a comment before we go to the next uh, um, comment? I, ju I just want to um, uh, address a couple of things. One is actually one thing in the letter that we received from Hearing Healthcare Providers of California. Um, 
I'll just read the bulleted statement. We adamantly object to any attempt or proposal to remove the practical exam requirement for dispensing audiologist applicants. This is a consumer safety issue. The reliance on their education, while the state is now opening five new audiology programs, is short-sighted and does nothing to protect consumers. Regulations run afoul of the fundamental mission of all boards, commissions, and bureaus of the Department of Consumer Affairs to protect the public. If officially promulgated by the board, HHP will strongly oppose these regulations and seek recourse at our disposal, including taking this issue to the state legislature. And then at the very end, um, it remains unclear that the audiology, this is the second, next paragraph, audiology educational programs require examinations pertaining to hearing aid fitting. As such, audiologists who wish to acquire dispensing license should continue to sit for the practical exam. So I just want to point out that this was the other issue. Um, one was the issue that Amnon brought up about the, the first time test takers. And then the second issue is whether audiologists are receiving the proper amount of training in their program. Is that correct, Joe? That is absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that uh, before we go on to that topic that everybody kind of just preface it with that, that that's what we're talking about. Can I make an addition to that sure. statement? That's my statement about the national test and also our state test is uh, at the previous meeting we were continually corrected if we tried to mention anything that was on the practicum. That's, that's the right way to do it. But under closed doors or in a private committee, you have the ability to maybe look at the, the what is on the national exam, if that's even possible. Well, the committee is a public committee. So it, whatever it takes to be able to get a private, an outside source, somebody who can compare the two tests uh, and see the actual percentages of that. And like I said, I posed the question, and, and I'm, I'm feeling well here the answer today, if somebody could do poorly with hearing aids on their national examination and then come to California and, then, and, and be an audiologist. And then, therefore, now we have no barrier between them also working with the consumer of the California. So, so, and just to clarify, yeah. the, the, the question about whether someone is evaluating the national exam and the practical exam behind closed doors, that was the purpose of the work that the Office of Professional Examination Services did mm -hmm. and the data that was provided to the board. So that work has actually been done. A hearing aid dispensing committee meeting is going to be a public meeting. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be a, a closed session meeting. Um, and I'll, I'll let Mike say first. Thank you, Dr. Rupa Balachandran, University of Pacific Doctor of Audiology Program. I appreciate the concerns for consumer safety, and we as a profession of audiology share the very same concerns, especially as training programs and as a Doctor of Audiology Program that is accredited both by the Council for Academic Accreditation, which is a national accreditationing body, and the Accreditation Commission for Audiology Education. Uh, I can address how audiologists get trained in amplification. Our curriculum is designed to be fairly similar across accredited programs across the country, and our students take three courses in amplification. These are three credit courses. A three credit class means they get three hours of hands-on instruction in person in their seat every week. And that is accompanied by 18 hours of homework and other tasks that students have to do. So students typically get several hours. So they take three three credit courses, which ends up in a lot of didactic education. In addition to that, our students have intensive clinical curriculum where they are constantly evaluated on every technique. It's a little, um, I wanna make sure that those who are outside of the audiology profession understand that the audiology profession is not independent of either recommending or dispensing hearing aids. So any audiology training program goes through a rigorous curriculum of all aspects of managing hearing loss, which includes otoscopy, taking a proper ear mold impression, making the impression, fitting the hearing aid, uh, intensive coursework in probe mic measures to make sure that output levels of hearing aids are set appropriately. We have intensive coursework and we have intensive curriculum. Students are required in, typically in every program to take a midterm and a final practical exam every semester that covers these topics. So I hope, I'm, and I'm happy to share our curriculum with the board. And I just wanted to 
highlight that we're not atypical as an audiology program, as a doctor of audiology program. Our curriculum, while rigorous, is representative of AUD programs across the country because we all are mandated not only by our licensing boards but by our accreditation boards and take that consumer protection responsibility very, very seriously. We see ourselves as healthcare providers. So I'm happy to provide curriculum that will address some of the concerns, which I think are very valid coming from your point of view in terms of consumer protection. But we are happy to share information that will allay some of these fears that audiologists somehow are not trained appropriately to handle these. So I'm happy to do that. If the board would like, we can share our curriculum and hours of training. And I know OPES did the same, and we're very, very fortunate, happy yeah. that you worked with uh, us. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. We should do it in the hearing and dispensing committee. At that time, we'll have all the data, I hope. That's one thing. The other thing, I, have a I wish you would stay still in the microphone here, because I have a question for you. How long ago? All the all the stuff that you talk right now, will you please? Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Nice to see you. It, when you talk about all this curriculum that are taking right now in throughout the state, throughout the country, sorry. Do you know for sure how long ago, like let's say twenty years ago, can you assure us that these people who graduated? at that time Master of Audiology, have done the same curriculum that we are doing now 20 years later? Can you assure us? I can only assure you of the curriculum and standards that AUD programs are adherent to, and that is the question that the board is evaluating currently. I'm not an expert on curriculum 20 years ago or what was done, and I don't think it's in the scope of my current position to be doing that. Yeah, because uh, why I'm asking it is because if the language is adopted, automatically every audiologist, regardless of his graduation year, will be exempt from practical death if he decided to start uh, having uh, getting into the hearing aid business. And then my role here is to provide an explanation of what our AUD programs how we're accredited Currently. and how we are Currently. doing. So Currently. the Sorry. rest is speculation at this point. Okay. Thank if you. If I may, just a point of clarification, I, I believe legal counsel did tell us what an audiologist can do. So regardless of whether an audiologist passes <coughs> or, or takes or doesn't take a practical exam, they can do everything that we've discussed with the exception of selling a hearing aid. So I just want to make that clear. Can I add to that statement that you just sure. made? Um, when it talks about, again, consumer safety, um, the consumer's dollars and cents are also part of their being. So if, you, uh, in a, if, it, if you're not qualified to sell something to somebody and you're doing it uh, inaccurately, you're not being tested correctly, you can cause damages that way as well. So I would like that to be on record. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, Paul, uh, how much an audiologist pay for a practical test. There's application fee, right? It's the same. It's the same, $500. $500. So last year, uh, 2018, maybe it's not even complete, there was over 60 uh, dispensing audiologists that went to the test. So it's looked like over $30,000 that we would lose if they will be exempt from the test, $30,000 a year. For this money, what I suggest is... Wait, do you want me to address that, the issue of the, the cost? Yeah, okay. please. Um, when it comes to the cost of the practical examination, mm -hmm. that, that dollar amount was established by the board um, I want to say back in 2009, am I correct, mm -hmm. Brian? In that ballpark, 2009, 2010? No, no, it was post, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 2012 in that ballpark. Correct. That's correct, okay. So when it was established by the board, it was established based on staff analysis of the cost of the exam. The way statute is written is it says the board shall determine the cost 
based the the licensing fee based on the actual cost of the examination now as you know we are we've been short staffed and as you know earlier Sean raises concerns about licensing when you have a small board and you lose one or two people it can have a it can have a pretty dramatic impact on workload so our regulations have been uh, have been behind one of our regulatory packages was to actually raise the exam fees I want to make it really clear that um, exam fees cover the cost of the exam so we would not lose revenue by doing fewer exams because basically we we kind of use the money in our budget to cover the cost and then the revenue comes in so it's basically kind of a no what I, what I want to say is that for thirty thousand dollar we could have a practical exam in Southern California which we don't have right now and this will remove the burden of audiologists in Southern California flying to Sacramento and lose a day that's what I mean for the thirty thousand dollar we should do a test in Southern California it will be easy for an audiologist to do it and also I think it's fair enough that the audiologist will be able to start working and what not wait after he finished school one year to do it. I agree on doing examinations in Southern California in our current model. That's off topic, but I will tell you I agree I agree from the standpoint of providing them both to audiologists and hearing aid dispensers that are currently required. Yeah, I know. But that's a that's another issue and that requires um, additional staff. I could talk about that in my budget report if you like. Sounds like a really great future <laughs> agenda item. <laughs> Real quick, because I know it's for another agenda item, but I would like to just remind the board that one of the reasons why the dental board, uh, a consideration in removing the registered dental assistant practical examination was due to standardization issues with Northern and Southern California test administration. It's very hard when you're at multiple sites trying to do the same thing. So just, uh, you know, file that away when this discussion comes up in the future. And um, I wanted to point out with regard to um, concerns about individuals who may have been licensed some time ago, uh, uh, being able to dispense um, hearing aids. Again, when you develop your regulations, you can put parameters in place to the extent to which you want to maybe grandfather certain individuals in based upon the recency of their education to make sure that they have met the current curriculum requirements. So again, um, there's a lot you can do through the regulatory process to make sure that you continue to protect consumers and patients. So quick note about that. Um, your statute, however, is very specific in that it says um, that dis uh, in order to be a dispensing audiologist, you have to have met the requirements of the 2532 and 20. 2535. 2. 2? No, it does not say 0.25. Right, yeah. So 0.2 is for audiologists who graduated, I think it's pre-2007. Mm -hmm. So um, I could definitely research that further, but uh, in terms of promulgating regulations, um, we may not have as much um, flexibility, flexibility in that in that area. So it would require statutory, statutory change. change. Okay, well, there's still Flexibility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to our, our original before this discussion started that um, we looked at the vote last time and uh, I was hoping people, if they had changed their mind, uh, that they might say so now so we can see, you know, where things stand. Um, and one other thing is, as far as I know, we do have an audiology practice committee. I used to be on it. <laughs> and as far as I know, I'm still on it. You still so, <laughs> so it's not that we don't have one. And I actually um, agree with Dr. White that um, this is really an audiology committee issue um, more than it is a, a hearing and dispensing committee issue. Uh, so if we decide that we're going to rethink our vote, um, I think it should be relegated to that committee since this is about audiology uh, licensure. Yeah. Am I on this committee as well? I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to do it in this committee? I'll do it in this committee. Well, we, we first okay. have to, uh, as uh, 
Kelsey mentioned, I, th I thought he said, we have to talk about whether we're going to rescind our previous vote. Right. Is that correct? Is yes. that the right language? Mm -hmm. So I moved. We're waiting There's for a second. Table, yeah. There's yeah. a motion on the table. Seconded. Seconded. Yes. There is a second. There is a second. No more public comment. Um, yep. Are there any more public comments? This is probably obvious to all of you, but it seems like those on the dispensing committee are the same people here that have already voted one way, and they've already heard all the information, so I don't know what more information they need to hear. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't make any sense to go to either of the committees if you've already heard the information and you've made your decision. So. Yeah, that's why I was trying to see if, the, if somebody had changed their mind. No further comments? No further comments? Then we'll call for the vote. Could you restate the, do you want to restate it? As I have it, the motion is to reconsider the prior board action that took place on August 9th, 2018. And we can make it more specific regarding the dispensing audiologist examination requirement. Does that? Is that accurately? Yeah, I know, but it's it sound like it sound like that we are taking off the table whatever has been done there, but I want it to be in context that we will either transfer it to the hearing and dispenser committee or to the audiology committee. Okay. That's I, so I want it to be I want it to be as a one stage so people will not think okay we just took it off and that's it and there is no follow up. Okay. So, so okay. Well, it, it might. It, it, if his second agrees, that it might be a, a, an amended emotion. Um, but your, if I'm hearing it correctly, your motion is to reconsider the previous board action that was taken on August 9, 2018, regarding the dispensing audiologist examination, and to further discuss it. At now I don't know in which committee it's. I but, have no. But, I have no issue with each committee. But at a committee level. At a committee level, and the committee, uh, with an instruction to committee to bring to the board, not not to drag it out, but to bring for the next meeting, to the board, a recommendation. So it's basically the board delegating it to a specific committee. Okay, and so Patty. I'm, I'm happy to you second this amended okay. motion. So since there's an amended emotion, let's continue to have uh, more board com board member comments and or public comments on this amended emotion. Any further comments from members of the board? Any further comments from members of the public? I guess the okay. elephant in the room to me is that even if this were delegated to a committee, either committee, no minds are going to change. That's my feeling. People will mm. feel the way they feel. Just, just a comment. May I say who comprises the audiology committee? It's Please. the two DAUs, it's the public member, the EMT, and then another public member. Brian, can you state the microphone for anybody that's following the webcast? Sure. The audiology practice committee is comprised of two audiologists, the ENT, which is a public member, and then another public member. Who, where does it rate them? Where is it there a regulation about it? There, there isn't. She's just telling us what it is right now. Oh. And as it was indicated, three of those folks are here now at the full board. And, and Kelsey, it's at the board chair's discretion. Yes. To the committee. Yes. So uh, my point is just that that's, that might be in like the board member procedure manual that was adopted at a certain point. It's a policy 
Um, and it's on the website too. Okay, so it, and it probably came from there. Um, however, it is also at the chair's discretion which um, committees exist for what purposes and which members are appointed to that committee, with the exception, of course, of the statutorily created uh, hearing aid dispenser committee. That's just a clarification. <laughs> but I think you should yeah. vote on the motion, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Then, um, we'll vote on the motion. No. No. Yes. No. No. I'm going to abstain since I wasn't a part of the original vote. Yes. I have it four against, one abstain, and two, four. Very much. Next to 5A, the agenda, discussion of possible action regarding the dispensing audiologist examination requirement. I just want to take this time to introduce one of our new staff members, Heather Olivares. Um, as you know, we've been trying to um, augment our staffing, and we just recently added Heather. Heather is our analyst who's going to be helping us with legislation and regulations. This is a position that we obtained through the budget change proposal process. So Heather's got her work cut out for her, quite a few regulation packages that we're working on. And this is, this is one of them. Okay, so in your packet on um, tab 5A, um, there's a memo um, from Paul that uh, basically goes over what happened at the prior meeting as well. Um, and now that you have decided to stay with that motion, um, the next step in the process is to develop regulations um, that will implement your vote that you just took. Um, so after the memo is um, some proposed language. It's fairly simple. Um, it states, an applicant for a dispensing audiology license shall meet the current licensing requirements for an audiology license and shall successfully take and pass the written examination required by section 2538.25 of the Business and Professions Code prior to being licensed. So of course um, we're open to any discussion, wordsmithing, changes that um, would be the pleasure of the board. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well as any the council as well. Can I just ask, Kelsey, uh, legal counsel, is there anything else that we need to consider in this language based on the discussions that we've had? I don't believe so. Okay. I think that that encompasses uh, setting forth the requirement for Only other thing um, possibly to consider is is whether or not to make the language a little bit more general um, in terms of the written examination requirement. If, for example, the statute changed at a certain time, that could be fixed with a, a section 100. Um, but as you see in the beginning, it just it's more general in terms of the current audiology requirements, licensure requirements. Um, it could be something like the current uh, written examination requirements for hearing aid dispensing as an alternative. How would you word that? I would probably. I, it, it's.
it's just an option, and you could just say. Uh, you you did generalize it though, right? From what we had before. I generalized the first part. Okay. Um, because there is two sections for audiologists, um, and if licensure requirements change, or statutes are added or removed. So it, it's it's at the purview of the board, but can you um, didn't quite get that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I you could change it. Let's see. What you could that? change it to say it's that last <laughs> sentence. Could, that, that, how could you change it? <laughs> uh, written examination currently required by the board. Which I, which section and item are you referring to? So, so rather than specifying like section. a specific section, mm -hmm. just say taking out the specific section and just generalizing, not, not specifying the exact section. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you talking about this? Or? No. Oh, here. This. No. This. Yeah. Oh, right here. <laughs> That's another fun one. Okay. So we'll we're on there. tab five a. <laughs> um. But then again, um. So that's something that. We can mull over, um, and, and I think that if you make the motion to delegate the authority to your executive officer to make non-substantive changes, that if we want to change this down the road, that is a simple fix. So, um, if you're good with it as is, we can do that. I move to uh, accept uh, proposed language as written and delegate authority authority to the executive offices to make non-substantive changes. And to notice the proposed text for a 45-day comment period um, as well? Yes. And put it for the formal rulemaking? Yes. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there any further discussion from the board? Okay. Hearing none. Is there any discussion from a member of the audience? Vanessa Kahina for HHP. We just want to point out that in 2009, when AB 1535 was enacted, uh, the legislation allows for the board to evaluate the requirement for the practical exam when the occupational analysis is completed, but the bill also includes the language in a determination is made that a different examination is to be administered. If we have considered the discussion from earlier today, that would mean the elimination of the practical exam, but the written exam would remain the same. So if this calls for a different examination, we believe that there should be some language regarding an audiological program and how that provides a safeguard for what a practical exam should be testing for. I would agree with that in a, a different vein, uh, and that is I'm not sure that the written exam covers enough in terms of the laws and regulations at the current time, it, that it may be more about, <clears throat> I don't know, anatomy and physiology of hearing or something like that, or hearing aid um, functioning. So I'd like to see some changes that, that attack those issues to make sure that we're all aware of them, if, if it's about fitting and selling of hearing aids. Can I, can I just ask, Vanessa, can I ask you a question? So are you saying that the language doesn't specify that they would be required to take a written examination? So the language, you know, obviously requires that everybody has to sit for the written examination if they want the dispensing license. Right. But for this different examination, if there can be some reference to a program and if there are any changes that need to be made to the written examination if we're taking the practical out, then those should be at least included in the red package and come back for draft review. I'm not sure I'm, I'm following. So language regarding that the, the board has opined that another, a, a new examination should be administered. If there can be a reference to such an examination or whatever the practical training is in a program, that could be referenced in this reg. So the statute itself says that the examination uh, 
is on the selling of hearing aids. So I'm not, so, so you're asking for, because it says in, let's see, it's A1 of 2539.1, mm -hmm. it says, and passes an examination approved by the board <coughs> relating to selling hearing aids. So, I'm trying to bridge, the, what reference would we be making to a practical program? Because the bill originally referenced the need to have a practical examination, respecting the history and the spirit of the law, at least, and making reference to what we would now replace for the practical exam, and having some reference to that. I apologize that I can't really wordsmith on the fly right no, now. No, I don't have to practice I, trust me, that in front I, of I, I know exactly how yeah. that is. Um, okay, uh, so I guess my concern would be is that I understand that the, as my understanding of the history of the, the bill is that um, the practical and written examination, and actually I can't be quoted on that because I would have to do alleged history to know that the practical and written examination were both given at the time that this bill was enacted, and I don't know that for certain. But it, it required the, the prior exam that had been administered by the, uh, what was the hearing aid committee? Was it the hearing Bureau. aid? Bureau. Bureau. Okay. And my apologies. Um, and then at such a time that um, a exam validation had been done um, and an occupational analysis, mm -hmm. then a new examination, if so chosen, would be administered. But going back to A1, it's only related to the selling of hearing aids. And a dispensing audiologist, by definition, is an audiologist that sells hearing aids. And that, I think, is... 25, <clears throat> the very first one, 2530.2 L, a dispensing audiologist is a person who is authorized to sell hearing aids pursuant to his or her audiology license. So I would not recommend to the board to have the practical portion of it unless it relates to selling of hearing aids because the statute requires um, that the examination be focused on selling of hearing aids. So I am I missing, or are we just well, not in the same more way? that I can't speak to the content of what's in the practical exam. Right, you know, right. The understanding was that it's to demonstrate proficiency in what we believe was fitting and selling, but if there was a different requirement for what a dispensing audiologist would get from having that additional certification, then that's a different conversation. Okay. So so maybe in the meantime, if the board is agreeable to it, um, I can just double check with OPS to make sure that, I, from what my understanding of it is, the practical examination um, does not focus on the selling of hearing aids, but I don't, I, I could work on that. I don't know if you have anything more to say. Yeah, I believe that at the, during the recommendation, OPS pointed out that the written exam would cover the requirements of the law and that the practical exam was overlapping with the training. So their recommendation was that the board accept the written exam as a requirement for audiologists to dispense hearing aids. So, just so I understand the request, the request is to then to have the written examination, but then a separate reference to the practical education of selling a hearing aid, if that does exist in an audiological program.
more confident about that. Can you, can you please restate? Pardon? Can you please restate the motion? The motion is to approve the regulatory changes um, and to direct the executive officer to initiate the rulemaking process and to also delegate to the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes and to put forth a formal rulemaking in the 45-day comment period. Thank you. Yes. 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 No. Okay. The motion passes. Okay, we're moving to 5B, and that is the discussion of possible action regarding the supervision of hearing aid dispenser training applicants, supervision and training required, and direct supervision. I think that's the title of the section in the Practice Act. Okay, so in your binder um, are two versions <coughs> of California Code of Regulations, section 1399.116. 1399.118 and 1399.119. Um, I reviewed your last meeting um, from August 9th and 10th, and I tried to incorporate all the changes that were discussed at that meeting. So first, I will walk you through what those changes are, um, and if you guys can verify that that was what the intent was, um, what you meant. Um, and then after that, I will go back um, because two outstanding issues still stand as far as the proposed definitions for direct and indirect supervision. Um, and we brought forth two new um, definitions for each for both of you to, for you guys to review. And then uh, the other outstanding issue is the continuing, continuing education hours for supervising dispensers. Um, and there was some discussion in making those align with the CE requirements for a slip of supervisors. Um, so I brought forth what that language currently is um, to discuss as well. So we'll start with version one, and in that I'll um, walk through the changes from the last meeting, and then we can go back and discuss the um, outstanding issues still. So, um, the first area. Can I just point something out? I, I just want to make sure that everybody is following something. This this discussion started in October of 2017, but these changes are the result of a hearing aid dispenser committee meeting that took place in February. So these are the actual, what Heather tried to do is incorporate those changes and then some board input that we received on continuing education requirements. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, in section 1399.118, um, in um, subsection C, which will be on page 2 of version 1, um, what was discussed at the last meeting is revising it to say, training consistent of at least the following for the duration of the trainee applicant's temporary license. And then um, a lot of the discussions surrounded what exactly would need to be included during the training program. Um, and what was added in number seven, subsection seven, is the electroacoustic analysis equipment and essential American National Standards Institute standards. And then um, under 10, is knowledge and verification techniques for hearing aid fitting, including rear, real ear measurements. And then 12 was added, assessment of ear mold impression and creation of ear mold impressions. So that's what I got from watching your last meeting. Um, if you guys have any changes, of course, um, we can still make additional changes. And otherwise, let me know if you're ready for me to go on to the next part. Are there any comments from the board? I think we're ready. Okay. Um, so the next part that um, was changed based on um, reviewing 
The last meeting was section 1399.119, and I'm looking in um, section F. It's after the initial 90 calendar days, with the exception of those services provided in subsection D, which require immediate supervision for the duration of the training applicant's temporary license. The supervising dispenser shall provide direct supervision for all other service to the trainee at all times. Is there any desired changes to that? Okay, okay. Um, so then we can go back to um, looking at some of the definitions that have been proposed for direct supervision and immediate supervision. Um, and I'll go over version one and then I'll flip over to version two so we can discuss kind of what you like best or if you want to mix and match from both of them or how you want to move forward. So in version one, um, it's direct supervision means the supervising dispenser has authorized the services to be performed by the trainee applicant and the supervising dispenser is physically present on the premises when the services are performed. Immediate supervision means that the supervising dispenser is physically present and immediately available within a service area to give aid, direction, and instruction to the trainee applicant. Then if you want to move to version 2, there's... Um, other definitions there as well. Um, so in that version, direct supervision means the supervising dispenser is on site and in proximity to where the training applicant is rendering services and the supervising dispenser is available at all times to provide observation, guidance, and assistance to the training applicant. Immediate supervision means the supervising dispenser is physically present and providing continuous guidance and assistance to the trainee applicant when client services are provided. While you're mulling over that, also, um, <laughs> um, HHP provided that letter um, that you all received, and um, I got to look at a copy of it yesterday, and so I went in, they had some very good points in there um, regarding this regulatory language, and so I went in and also made a few changes based on their recommendations, um, and so that is the color copy version, which tries, maybe unsuccessfully, but I, I did my best, um, <laughs> to marry all of the versions and include some updated language um, based on the feedback received from HHP. Um, so, so that's the blue is what you're talking about. Um, so, yes, so it's, when, okay. it's blue, though. Uh, well, those are the different options for immediate and direct. So I just wanted to show you that there are three different options. The first one that's not highlighted is what the, the board talked about at the last meeting and came up yes. with. The one that is, sorry, I don't have a color copy in front of me. The one that is yellow um, is one that I, um, I think it was Nevada had a similar statute, um, and I honestly can't recall for which licensure it was, but, um, and then the third, um, Heather uh, crafted as well, so the third that's in blue. And what I uh, modeled um, in version two after is um, looking at the Board of Acupuncture. Um, they have on-the-job type training um, as well for acupuncturists, and um, I looked at what their definitions were and modeled it after that. So, so those are the, th the three different options you have for the different definitions of, of supervision, um, direct and immediate. Um, 
and again, we can come up with a new one today. Um, but that was the highlighting is just showing the different versions. What um, the red portions of the document, the red text, is where I made changes yesterday. But we don't have colored copies. Uh, you should. It was passed out. It's not in the binder. Is it over there? It's right. So, does everybody have one? And there should be one. Do you need one, Marsha? No, I got it. Okay. So, yes. Um, so I don't have our um, supervision definitions memorized, but I'm just wondering: uh, are, are we now creating some new definitions rather than using definitions that we've used for slip of supervision, for example? Yes. I know we have direct and, and immediate yeah. for slip of supervision. Is, are the slip of definitions included in these versions? No. Okay. No, no, no. So, so they're modified. So I guess that's my concern is that um, for consistency's sake, I think we were happy with how we defined direct and immediate supervision for slip ups. Um, so I, that I think is a little different because in, in that context, if I remember correctly, and again, I don't have them in front of me, yeah. but that was telesupervision. So I'm not talking about the oh, okay. I'm talking about going back oh, to when we did slip up supervision. So not tell them. I, I think there are specific definitions um, for for slip us regarding supervision. What we tried to do is present two versions and then we heard from the profession on some suggestions that they had. So we we may want to just consider these three and decide if these satisfy what we're looking at, I can actually point you to the slip of supervision. Too. I, I, I think it. I'd like to yeah, just one, revisit that it's also. It's 1399170. Um, and I, I do want to point out it is in 2001. Okay. So we may, it might be, you know, it might, it might be um, in need of an update. But direct supervision means on site observation and guidance by the supervising speech language pathologist while a clinical activity is performed by the speech-language pathology assistant. Direct supervision performed by the supervising speech-language pathology may include, but is not limited to, the following. Observation of a portion of the screening or treatment procedures performed by the speech-language pathology assistant, coaching the speech-language pathology assistant, and modeling for the assistant. Immediate supervision means the supervising speech-language pathologist is physically present during the serv services provided to the client by the speech-language pathology assistant. And I think that is actually the same. Yeah, I would say that the yellow version uh, is very similar to that. The first one is general, and then the blue version addresses some of the specific issues that specifies that this supervision is required while they're doing, uh, while they're actually conducting hearing aid dispensing duties, right? So, um, and I, so I, I think that the, the, from what I heard at the last meeting, um, that I think um, it seems that the direct supervision for uh, assistance relies a lot on professional judgment of the supervisor because it is a list that is not limited to, mm -hmm. and so it, it doesn't, it's not as concrete, and what I had heard at the last meeting is that there should be concrete supervision parameters okay. in this context. And so that's why um, I modeled it the, the way that, that we did. Um, but again, if that's not what the board, uh, how the board wants it, it's open for discussion. Okay, so I guess I'll go through too. Um, you just mull over the whole thing. Um, so if we go back to the beginning, um, and I'm I'm on the color okay. uh, one. Um, the first question I have, and I don't actually this wasn't actually raised from HHP, but they had raised the concern about um, this the supervising dispenser and the CE requirement. I don't feel like um, you're Stormy Daniels. Is her Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Let's listen to that. <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> 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 
quite that out. That doesn't go in the minutes, does it? That's not part of the minutes. <laughs> Supervising dispensers have nothing to do with Stormy Daniels, um, but uh, they had raised a concern about completing CEs, uh, and so when I went back to look at the CEs, uh, my question was whether or not uh, this was in addition to their current CEs or if it was just something that is folded into the, the CE. So you, you do your CE, but we want it to be in this specific area if you're going to be a supervisor, or if it meant... You do your CEs, and then on top of that, you have to okay do that. Um, so can I answer that? Or um, yeah, can I? You may. So for that. our other continuing education units, the um, CE requirements are specific to supervising, and then there are additional CE requirements for just general CEs. The you know the number of, of 20, 24 every two years, but. Specific, but specifically for supervision, it's those four hours in advance of supervision and then two hours every every couple of years. So that's in a, that is a piece of the required continuing education, but specific to supervision. Yes. That would be included in whatever the total number of CEs are required. So you're required to do a certain amount, and if you want to be a supervisor, a portion of that, that amount yeah. needs, needs to be, be in, super in supervision. Exactly. Okay, so I would suggest making this language clearer to, uh, to say so. Um, Heather has a comment. Um, if you look in uh, version 2 that's um, in your binder um, in 1399.116C, I did put in um, what the current CE requirements yes. are for slip of supervisors. Yes. Um, but I did just want to point out that hearing aid dispensers are on a one year renewal cycle, so we're not necessarily comparing apples um, to oranges, so to speak. Um, so if we want to discuss um, maybe adjusting it to yes. be what it would be each year. So right now it says six hours um, bef during the initial two-year period. We could probably keep that um, since it's still two-year period. But then when it says three hours of continuing education every two years thereafter, we may want to discuss prorating that um, to be applicable to a one-year one year. renewal cycle. So for our going back to hearing aid dispensing and supervisors of hearing aid dispensers, um, are our continuing education, I just can't remember, are, are the continuing education units um, that are regulations or statutes? Um, for the CE requirements for slip of supervisor, this is in regulation. Oh, no, not slip of supervisor. I'm talking about the, hear the new ones, the revised the, the current hearing aid dispensing CE requirements. Is that regulation or is that statute? Yes. So it's regulation. So I suggest that we conform everything. And, and can we make it two years or is that? Well, that's a, no, that, that, that part requirement is, not. is in statute. Oh. Yeah. And, and I think I that okay. at, at the last meeting, um, someone raising issue, I'm not exactly sure who it was, but one concern, a couple of concerns I have from an administrative point of view is keeping track of. Um, windows that are outside, like the re, if the renewal is a one-year renewal, yeah. now we're going to have to keep track of a two-year requirement. Yeah. And I can imagine that would be a little Harry bit Humphrey's difficult for the person <laughs> yeah. conducting the audits, and I'm yes. looking at one of the persons that <laughs> yes. conducts the audits. Yeah. I'm sure that would be no fun. The other, the other issue that I've heard in, in the dispensing community, and I know that it was brought up last time, is the fact that a lot of these classes aren't out there. So we're going to require something that may not be available right now and I'm not sure what's out there I you know I apologize for my ignorance in that area but I, I understand there are some real limitations to these courses yep. yeah, well, I'd love to hear from, from individuals on that uh, to the best of HHP's knowledge there the curriculum for a trainer for training hearing sensors does not exist it would have to be created on the other hand, if it's made a licensing requirement, that would be lucrative for someone to be doing that. It also can create a barrier. Could do that as well. But our experience, at least I'll, I'll speak for speech language pathologists, that when 
new requirements come on board for our standards, for example, all of a sudden all this continuing education comes up. But then we are a very continuing education-based profession. But I've never seen it not to be that case. So I have a question. Um, so right now as it's worded, and um, again, Heather and I are not in the field, so um, this language is just based off of what we do know. But so it says development in professional development and supervision training. Could that be altered in some way so that it would fit into some categories that are offered as CEs currently? It's beyond my knowledge to know like what exactly we can do. I know if you have a title, and I'm sure things can be built around it. But there's also that's more just my personal opinion than uh, I'm not sure of all the heavy lifting it would take to to create that and make sure that it's it's adequate, follows all the guidelines uh, necessary for for training. Um, without also, I mean, uh, I know I'm, I do proctoring for the exam, and again, we have to be careful of training trainees when we also, and creating a curriculum with those that also kind of know the exams, and how, how are we coming up with this, this uh, these information to, to do it as well. So there, there is a little bit more to it than just, let's create a weekend seminar. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I'm sure that it could be, it could be years of, you know, I say years because that just comes out of my mouth, a year, years, <laughs> who knows how long it could take to create something like that. Okay. <clears throat> Could CAA speak to, yeah. to how they do um, develop such CEU uh, training seminars for the fourth year AD student? Um, for RPEs in the state of California, um, the application for the training says there's an initial six hours before you can have an RPE, an SLP, CFY, or an AUD extern. It's uh, six hours initially and three hours every four years after that. And that's what is on the application for to have an RPE. So I don't know what the regulations are. Okay, so that's a supervisor's requirement. The supervisor to has to, in order to be the supervisor of record for an RPE, you have to have six hours initially and four hours every three hours every four years after that. Um, and so th there's that, and we have, um, uh, we have previously put on, put on seminars, but also uh, Audiology Online, I think SLP Online, but, uh, but Audiology Online has uh, CEUs for preceptor training or supervisor training. Um, there are also, there's been some stuff developed by the Council of Academic Programs in yeah. Communicative Sciences mm -hmm. and Disorders. Um, there are some modules uh, there, and then the um, American Board of Audiology also has a certificate program for supervisor training. Um, so, yeah, so there are some stuff online. There isn't any specific requirement with regards to um, what the CEUs have to in, encompass. Um, it's just that they're supervisor training. And um, to my knowledge, it's just been my experience, so you can absolutely tell me that I've been wrong, I'm wrong. Um, there hasn't been any oversight with regards to does an RPE preceptor of record actually have to submit that they've had supervision hours. I have to manage it. I follow it, and I make sure all of my super my supervisors submit their hours to me, so I can verify they've had them. But they've never um, they're surprised when I do that because they're like, "Well, we've never had to submit this before." I mean, so when they apply to the state, they sign that yes, I've had these hours. Some of them have, some of them have not. Many, and, and I can tell you, many of them have not. Many of the new ones. So, is it true that the, the American Academy has a certificate for? Receptors? Uh, yes, sorry, I think I said American Board of Audiology, but uh, the, <coughs> yeah, that's ABA, that's it may be ABA. but yeah. yeah, it's the CHAP, the Certificate um, for Supervision. Mm -hmm. But that's not mandatory? It's not, it's not mandatory to be a supervisor, no, um, in California it's just these CEUs, you know, if, if I have a student that goes outside of California, there's not a requirement to 
for their perception to have supervision require or training. Mm. Mm. We're about the only state in the country that requires our receptors to have supervisor training. Really? Mm -hmm. Although now the um, new stamp for it, if, for if you're looking at um, CFCC requirements for audiologists, the new standards that become effective in 2020 will have a requirement for yeah, supervision. One hour? One hour, yes. Forever? I mean, it could yeah, be 10 years it. ago, it's no, one hour, it's 10 years ago, no, that's got to start required. somewhere. But yeah. Yes, but. that's correct. Mm -hmm. So I think one issue of concern here, though, is that the entry level for being a hearing aid dispenser or the entry level for being an audiologist are, are very, very different. So the whole issue of continuing education training is not consistent at all. We're, so we're, we're the apple and it's apples and oranges. It is. That's it right. Is. But yeah. Right. So we have to keep that bear that in mind also as far as And the only point I was making is uh, just some information that I've received. Um, my concern is that we put this requirement out there and th those courses are not available. I do think that it could be a barrier. And, um, you know, but again, I don't, I don't know what is currently out there. It sounds like there isn't much out there and these would have to be created. I never think that we should avoid doing something that would protect consumers if it's uh, hard. Yeah. I, I do want to point out that in 2538.28, which is the temporary license, um, the super supervisor, um, 2538.28. Two, 2538.28. Mm -hmm. 2538.28. Oh. Um, subsection? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to get there before I lost it, and I think I might have lost it. This section um, spoke to training of the supervisor, but I might be wrong. I think that's actually move on, move on. Yeah. That is in the regulation, though. My apologies. Can I just quickly speak to, before okay. we do that, is anybody interested in taking a break? Yes. Okay. 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 Five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah. We'll say we'll five take a, Everyone will take ten. We'll take a ten minute break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we've thrown out a lot at you guys. Um, uh, so if you want to first discuss um, the definitions for direct and indirect supervision, if you kind of want to mold and merge the multiple versions or come up with something completely different, um, it's your discretion. And then after we get through that, we can walk through the CEs and what we want that to look like. Did, it, 
Did HHP want to comment on the direct supervision and direct supervision suggestions and what the board has proposed? I think your comments are reflected in the, the dark blue version. No? That's what you see. Is that the third version? I think they were proposing to tell us I'm not sure if I see the changes that we had recommended to the supervisor and supervising dispenser. I guess I can check. So I think that if I'm, if my understanding of the letter is correct, you guys were more suggesting a telesupervision structure. In certain circumstances. In certain circumstances, yes. Right. And I, and I, I had not proposed that because of the last board meeting. What I had heard from the board was that they did not want somebody to be in a different location than the supervisor, the supervisor to be in a different location and not at the place that the supervisee trainee was. And I think, Amnon, correct me if I'm wrong, you had discussed about how in certain situations the trainee is at one branch and the supervisor is at a completely different branch. And so you, you had, had proposed not to do any sort of telesupervision. Absolutely. It's a different city even. Yeah, I, and I called, by the way, I read briefly the type of supervision and I think it's immediate supervision should be over the shoulder. And you didn't mention, I think you should mention immediate supervision in a different way, like being in. I thought it was over the shoulder. Huh? I thought it was over the shoulder. No, read, what is the immediate supervision that you wrote there? They all say physically present. Physically present. This is different. Physically present could be in different floor even. What is physically, it's not, it's, it's, it's not precise. And I think it has to be in the same room, what's called over the shoulder. Well, if you look at version two, immediate supervision means the supervising dispenser is physically present and providing continuous guidance. So I kind of picture that as they're right there next to them. We need to be, we have to make it sure that he needs to be present by the person performing the ear milk impression. The wording available in the service area was actually, available in the service area wording I thought was not too ambiguous. Available? Available in the service area. I don't know. That's on the third, the option three, it's a little hard to read. Available in the, I don't know what this is. Sorry about my color choice. Oh, okay. I can't read. I'm sorry, I didn't know it would print like that. If I may. It is physically present, yes. If I may, I can read that third version. Yeah, please. Now that I have my readers. Immediate supervision means that the supervising dispenser is physically present and immediately available within the service area to give aid, direction and instruction to the trainee, to the trainee applicant. And so I think Amnon's point is well taken. I think there is a difference between being over the shoulder and being immediately, some people work at different times. Yeah, no, some different floors and they said, look, he can call me right away to be downstairs. So I think we did address that by saying that in the first, it's not a subsection, it's the first sort of paragraph of 139919. It says, supervision shall mean either direct or immediate supervision. Supervision shall not include supervision by telephonic or electronic means. Yeah, but again, there is one, there's a lot of aspect that the temporary license is doing that does not require really immediate supervision, like how to fill up the contract or maybe even doing the test, the audiometric test, so important. But taking the ear mold impression is so important for at least for the beginners. I'm talking about when you start temporary license, there's a point to do your first impression. So it's so critical for this. So it has to be a really, really word, word precise. So people understand you have to be with the temporary license when you do this. And this is a very important point. Thank you. 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 Thank you
you're in the room with them, Amnon. You're huh? right there next to them doing it. Yes. In the immediate area. No, them. immediate. In the room. In the room. Maybe right in the, the word room. Okay. In the same room. But, but I, that's what I was going to say. Well, yeah. I, I, you, can you specify they must be in the, the same room? room. In the very same room right next to us. Because in the same service area, it can be the whole hospital. I, I, you know, it's vague. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. If I might, um, so I did a little bit of research, and I, um, other states are not set up the same way we are, so I want to mm -hmm. throw that out there first. Um, and in most states, it is like an actual formal training that occurs. But um, for Florida, they do have some language that I'll read to you. They, they break it down into different stages of the training program, um, but it says for stage two, um, during this stage, the trainee may perform audiometric tests and make ear mold impressions and modifications, but the sponsor or hearing aid specialist designated by the sponsor shall be physically present in the same room at all times when the trainee is performing these functions. The trainee may not recommend the selection of hearing aid, dispensing hearing aid, or counsel clients. So they they are the same language that I'm proposing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you like that sort of that language? It says the same room. It says the yeah. same room yeah. the same at room. all times. <coughs> so after physically present, it would say, and in the same room or in the same room, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. At all times. Well, we're just talking about the general definition of immediate supervision. Right. Okay. Right. So we're just adding the same room. Do we have a preference to which version? Uh, so, I can't, this is unreadable. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about that. Maybe you can make a noise. You can tell us what the blue says. I can. So for immediate supervision, it says, means that the supervising dispenser is physically present and immediately available within the service area to give aid direction and instruction to the trainee applicant. So that would say immediate supervision means that the supervising dispenser is physically present in the same room and immediately available to give aid, direction, and instruction to the trainee applicant. Does that satisfy yeah. you? Yeah, and I believe this will create much better people and much bit higher pass rate. All right, we've got a definition for immediate supervision. <laughs> Do you want to read it one more time, just please? Yes. Thank immediate you. supervision means that the supervising dispenser is physically present in the same room and immediately available to give aid, direction, and instruction to the trainee applicant. Thank you. And I think that um, okay. So, do we want to tackle direct supervision? Yes. Mm -hmm. I can read the two different options. Um, so, version one option is direct supervision means the supervising dispenser has authorized the services to be performed by the trainee applicant and the supervising. Dispenser is physically present on the premises when the services are performed. Version two version is um, direct supervision means the supervising dispenser is on site and in proximity to where the trainee applicant is rendering services and the supervising dispenser is available at all times to provide observation, guidance, and assistance to the trainee applicant. And if I might, um, I would just like to, to 
advice, advise the board that I think um, HHP had a really good point about services and that um, that can mean a whole host of things. And so um, what I am suggesting is instead of services, inserting um, some sort of verbiage that fits within the sentence that says practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. Because that would not include answering a telephone. Right. Is and that covered in the third version? <laughs> um, so it, it, I had put it in subsection B with an, an immediate supervision where it, it says, because that one did have services in it, and I crossed that out, and you, as you can see in red, okay. it says the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. So, it, it, for example, if the board uh, liked option two, um, direct supervision means the supervising dispenser is on site and in proximity to where the training applicant is practicing fitting and selling hearing aids, and the supervising dispenser is available at all times to provide observation guidance and assistance to the training applicant. I think I would defer to Mr. Bartlett in terms of if there are any duties within fitting and selling. In the letter, you'll also see that we recommended potentially adding indirect supervision, which I believe is covered in other statutory or practice acts. But that case could include the duties where there is no patient harm whatsoever and also lets the office manage themselves right. in a practical way. Yeah, that should be for clerical duties types of things, clerical and billing duties. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, clerical and billing duties, but at, at some point in time, the supervision levels change. Like right now, we haven't gotten to this point, but the 90-day point that's in there, um, certain tasks that become, uh, you know, stay as immediate supervision, but there are certain tasks that should be also to go into indirect supervision as well because of, the again, the harm level that's changed in that. So. Can, can we tackle the direct supervision definition? Yeah, yeah. Do either of you have a suggestion based on the... I think the second version... Okay. I believe two was, was fine for that. Mm -hmm. Proximity is, yeah, being. Yeah. So services would just be changed to the practice of yes. fitting and selling mm -hmm. hearing aids. Yeah. Yes. And I believe that's not ambiguous enough to where we're not. I mean, in the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids, you're doing audiometry. So you're not having to say and hearing testing. If I, if I yeah, and, and the reason I that. chose that is that, that it is defined right. in statute. Thank you. So, so I think the intent of the direct and immediate requirement was to specify that those tasks that require direct and immediate requirement. If something's not listed as requiring direct and immediate, then do we need to define what indirect is? I think at this point we possibly do because some of the things listed in immediate supervision may change over, over time. Uh, like I said, otoscopy is one of those things that does take some training. Uh, but I don't feel as long-term training that, 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 that you need to be watching otoscopy every single time. Um, some hearing testing, uh, once again, I, don't, I personally don't agree with the 90-day, so that's why I kind of keep looking. I don't think 90 days is going to say now you can do hearing testing by yourself. I think there has to be a better milestone than that. So in my mind, if fictitious milestone is met, the person should be able to do an, un, an unsupervised hearing test, but continually being monitored by their supervise the dispenser just to make sure they're signing off on the test and, and everything's been done correctly. So rather than a specific timeline, it's skills-based, have they acquired Skills-based or, I mean, we, as a dispenser, we have two tests. Okay. So, uh, I mean, at the completion of one or both, um, I've, it's probably not the forum for, but I've, I've talked about the potential of having the tests flipped or they're optional, which one comes first or second, so that they can be, you know, done, practical skills can be done earlier that way. And uh, you can be signed off to do otoscopy or something like that. <coughs> I, I have a couple of questions. Is do we have three categories of supervision here or two only? Two. 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 So at okay. the at the last board meeting, we only discussed two, um, and we had put in language that did not allow indirect supervision. So we had put in mm -hmm. language that said you cannot do it via telephone or electron other electronic means. Uh, because there's some tasks that are really not risky if if the te the guy temporary license sitting in an office and his supervisor is not there and somebody walk into the office and wants to acquire get advice and he can show him this is good for this kind of loss this is good for he giving him advice but not conducting a, any test or anything without supervision but just doing this and giving them an idea and giving them prices and idea on this. 
I, I don't know. This could be just pure supervision, and uh, not uh, it's not critical. And I don't know enough about the profession. Would yeah. that be considered fitting? Part of fitting a hearing aid. It's it's it very it's a small part of it, which mm -hmm. is really not risky because no decision was taken, no procedure was taken. It's just person step in and got an advice on, on, on hearing aids, what they cost, what they're good for, what they're not good for, and stuff. Yeah, we like the person to be qualified, but if he's not qualified, not immediate harm happened to the customer. So are we, are we saying then that there are times when that trainee can be alone? Yes. Okay. Then I think in that case, we have to look at the very first paragraph. 1399.119, because that's where it establishes that supervision has to be either direct or immediate, and I think that's a concern that HSP yeah, is no. raising. Be because uh, the temporary license can be left alone in the office, and the supervisor will will go home, and he will not do tests, he will not take ear impression, but he will be in the office because the office hour take, he will receiving hearing aid for repair, he will put it here for the boss to come tomorrow and he will give advice or something. This does not require the person to be in the, in, in, in the premises, the, I mean the supervisor, the trainee can, can be there. And just <coughs> cur curious, what happens when a customer comes in that mm -hmm. needs a hearing test or he will tell He will make an appointment. Okay. So, uh, as, my, as I understand it, that's not the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. That's more of the receiving like, upkeep, possibly it, right. So, so the way yeah. so <laughs> I did change it to say that the supervision shall be provided by the supervising dispenser for the duration of the trainee applicant's temporary license at all times while the trainee applicant is engaged in the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids. So, so am not am I? Do, is there are there certain functions that are within the scope of the practice and fitting of selling hearing aids mm -hmm. that the the trainee would be able to do without I, I, any supervision? Maybe maybe giving an advice about the hearing aid. Let's say what's good for high frequency loss or not power hearing aid. May I don't know. It might fall in in the practice of uh, hearing aid dispenser. Yeah, I, I think, think it, and it, this shouldn't be uh, physically supervised by somebody. If the if this person comes in with an audiogram though, and you're having to interpret the audiogram yeah. and apply this knowledge to mm -hmm. that, I think it becomes a hearing aid evaluation, yeah. and it's not something that should go unsupervised. That's right. If they just come in no, with no, nothing yeah. and just say, just this tell me about yes, it. Yes, I want to know this cost this much, this cost mm -hmm. this much. This I need to repair, leave it here, or make it an appointment. But you can't talk about high frequency hearing loss and things like that because that means interpretation mm. of the audiogram. No, no, it doesn't come with an audiogram. I said, in, no, interpretation of audiogram has to be supervised, direct. Um, I, 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 I think should be direct. Direct is in the same building, but not over the shoulder. Are you talking doing your own uh, uh, audiogram or bringing in one from somewhere else? Because you certainly yeah. probably had that situation where somebody comes in with an existing audiogram and, and they want to, they're, they're I give shopping it, or they're interested in hearing. Yeah, you what we do when, when we get when we get something like this in our office, we might give him initial thing, but we will always test. We'll never, I'll never uh, trust uh, an audiogram. I okay. always make our own test to compare if it's the same ball game. I guess there's three things potentially. There's the fitting of hearing aids, the selling of hearing aids, and then there's the third part of it, and that's the upkeep after the fact, which is you're going to get walk-in service, you can walk in people asking questions, yeah. new testing. I mean, yeah. be, I think interpreting a hearing test is part of the sale of a hearing aid, yeah. ultimately, um, or the adjustment of a hearing aid that's been already yes. sold, potentially. And again, that's now in that third part of it. So it's not the initial fit, it's a post fit. So I don't, maybe the definition that we're just saying of fitting and selling hearing aids, that might be just too narrow. Uh, it's because it's not the full scope of what we do because there is I, aftercare as well. I don't well, want to create. The, so I'm sorry. I don't want to create a situation when a trainee left by himself in the office and this caused a violation. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's so there's some simple task that he can do without causing a violation to direct supervision. Mm -hmm. That's what I. So, yeah, and so I think what I what we're. 
let me answer your question first. Um, practice of fitting and selling hearing aids um, does include any necessary post-fitting counseling. So it is part of that. Um, I think that would be included in that. Um, so we, I, I hear what you're saying, and so that means that we need to carve that out or create a new framework. Um, because well, as, it, as it was at the last meeting, I think we really just focused on we didn't, you, the board didn't want to have a situation where um, there are several branches and the supervisor never comes to the branch where the trainee is, and the right. trainee is just running this branch essentially by themselves. There, is so. a, there, there still could be several branches, but the supervisor has to be present at the time the trainee doing the those fitting tasks. And, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the question is: is can we narrow it down? Can we can we narrow down the practice of fitting and hearing and selling hearing aids? Are there some exceptions to that? Because if we say the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids, that means that they don't need to be present when they're scheduling. They don't mm -hmm. need to be present when they're doing some sort of inventory task. Um, yeah. Or I, I don't know and what else. Not, <laughs> do we, do we but, even need to specify what is in direct supervision if we're specifying what is direct and immediate yeah. supervision? Yeah, uh, if, and we can just uh, and we just sentence. can right. add one sentence in the direct supervision. Direct supervision does not imply to this, this, and this. Okay, so that is so for and is it for the duration of so the the very yeah. first day that the trainee comes in, these tasks yeah. do not apply. Yeah, and what even, would Okay. Even if I think he, I would rather just, just say what it does apply to right, because yeah. it could become quite a list. The definition yeah. kind of in line with the three, and then I know down below you're using subsections to state out, like what carve out. Or carve, yeah, so I think the definition is more or less what, what do we want those tasks to be, not what are those tasks per se, yeah. what exactly supervision are we looking on those. And then I think later on we can say, my thoughts are things like uh, replacing tubing. Once mm -hmm. you've shown that you somehow can do it, if someone walked in the door and needed to cut a little bit longer because it was yeah. cut too short during the fitting, that person should have that done by whoever's available that has skilled to do it. Otherwise, waiting now causes sores, causes stuff in the ear that should be done immediately if the person's skilled enough to do it. And that'd be at a point of indirect supervision. Uh, otoscopy, looking down an ear because someone comes in and says, I, I lost my earbud. You know, you should be able to, that, that person, for the safety of the person, should be able to take a peek down the canal if they're at that indirect supervision point and make sure that there's not a, another need for referral to the doctor. So it's almost a third, uh, that third level just needs to be defined, and then we can talk, I think, I mean, later on about what levels change from immediate supervision to direct to potentially indirect. If that's, uh, the way I'm reading it, the way that's kind of how it, it reads in the... That's right. Okay, so I just have a quick comment. Um, so I, I thought we were referring more to administrative task, and otoscopy, I think, yeah. requires a little bit more. That's not part of the uh, uh, fitting or sales of, of hearing aids would, would be the, the, the clerical work in that. I know right, but there could be things. harm if someone came yeah. in with an earbud in and someone wasn't skilled enough to look in the ear and see that and said, I don't no. see it and send them home. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I agree. And that's why I would, I would say that that should be, um, it's 100% supervised at the very beginning, as in yeah. there is a, Look, someone standing right next to it. Right right looking into right, the ears right. is risky as well, yes. Uh, it shouldn't yeah. be done without... As the risk level lowers because of the training person's showing of skills, again, if they, I guess it's hard to, to say it, that uh, that couldn't happen, because I know it's, it's happened with those that are very skilled and <laughs> sent right. someone home without knowing. Um, but I guess more of the idea is, is as, as right now, and we all, as we all know, 20% is nowhere near enough supervision for some of the tasks that are being asked to be done. And someone can be in one location and saying, well, I'm supervising five different offices right now. I have five offices. I could say that. I don't do that. But, well, that's, mm -hmm. but that's, I can see the potential. So 100% mean you're in the room. You know, Direct yeah. meaning you're in the office yeah. somewhere, but accessible, not by phone. Indirect meaning you could be on vacation, yeah. maybe, and someone came in the door with a, maybe a very small litany of hearing aid dispensing tasks.
that would then, by and only reaching that point because they've, like I said, passed, at this point, 90 days, maybe not, but passed an exam, whatever it took down the line for it. So, um, but that third definition, I think, is more where we're, and if it's necessary to. Temporary license, if I'm not mistaken, is only six months, right? Yes, and it could be renewed um, two times. one time. Oh, it's two times. Is it two times? One, two, two. two. Uh, 18, 18 months total. 18 months. Oh, why, why is this? A temp, yeah, no, tra yeah, they're both temporary and training city. Uh, is there a purpose for the renewal? Are you talking about training license yeah, or temporary? Yeah, why, why the trainee can, renewing is temporary. Why shouldn't he go to test? I've, I've, n I've never understood it, but that's why we're standing here today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's why it's, uh, uh, what, yeah. Yeah. you said two times, that's... Well, well, what was your question, Amnon? About the, the period of time of temporary license. The initial period is six months. And then I hear there's renewals. I believe temporary might be different than training. So are you? Are you well, well, the training no, is 12 months and temporary is six months. Six, six months, but you can renew the training <coughs> license two times for a total of 18 months total. At 10 months, you have to have taken right. a written test. And what by is, the end of your 18 months, what is the difference between training and temporary license? So they're both called temporary license in the statute, but okay. it. One, one works like reciprocity. Use, yeah, we use we use the trainee licensee one to say mm -hmm. the tr the temporary trainee licensee. Um, the other one is for out of state, right? Is it yeah, yeah, but state? I think Amnon understands that. I think what he's asking is why the different time frame, right? Why why one is no. one year and one can be extended to eighteen months? Is that what you're asking? No, no. I thought why 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 so many extension a person need. Right, so so the trainee, I, I don't know why, I wasn't here when those regulations were written, they were yeah. probably written by the, the committee or the bureau many years ago, yeah. but the, 2011. I think 2011 was when they merged, but I think they were yeah. written. No, well, it's yeah. my, yeah. my dad. Yeah. I, I believe that yeah. what, what happens is when you fail the test and different requirements are placed on the trainee, mm -hmm. they require, you know, 100% supervision, right? So, I think it just affords them that opportunity to get trained, yeah, and then hopefully pass the exam. Yeah, so I thought one extension max is enough. Why, 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 eighteen months? Yeah, I don't. I can't answer that question. No, no I no. mean we we want to to have the people go and license themselves. You know, we, we encourage them and not just drag it on a temporary. Uh, that's what we want to have more people license as soon as possible. So I said maximum one renewal. So in one year, a person should should do the test. The same one year as a out of state license need to do the test. We give him one year. So that would require a statutory change. So that might be because that is in statute. That's not in, in regulation. So mm -hmm. that might yeah, be something. Ten months to, to take the written test. Uh huh. It's yes. ten months before you have to take the written test. Yeah. Uh huh. That's no, I'm talking uh, out of state uh, license hearing a dispenser can work here on a temporary basis for one year but then has to be within one year within this one year to take the test right. so could be the same one year is enough for uh, anybody here under supervision or they need to do the same thing perhaps it was written that way to allow them the opportunity to get into the practical examination. That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. because yeah. it's not easy. That's, it's not easy. Yeah. Mm. What the board yeah. only has Getting to do two a year by yeah. statute. How many we do? But we, well, do four. we do we do more now, we but do, I, yeah. I imagine it was more I difficult. Think it's about three a year and you have to overnight your application in order to get it there the day. <laughs> that registration begins because it fills up quickly. Oh, there, there have been times. So to, in this the past is us. Was we have to solve this problem. I know. Then, I mean, <laughs> sounds like talking another about really great future agenda <laughs> item. <laughs> <laughs> so back to indirect supervision. <laughs> 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 Are we specifying? Uh, are we specifying uh, tasks or duties that require indirect supervision? Or yeah, indirect. Yeah, any clerical. Yeah, I would say administrative. Uh, so yeah, administrative, administrative does not fall within the practice of fitting or or selling hearing aids. Right. So we are have already carved that out that exception. So 
no direct or indirect supervision needs to occur when they are not engaged in the practice of bidding or selling. Yeah, but like cutting the tube is not risky of a VTE to, to shorten or, or even to replace a tube. It's really not risky. It can be a sloppy job, but it's not a risk to the patient. So I think there's maybe minor repairs. I don't know. Who do you agree, though, that, sorry, I said, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, would you agree, though, that it's something that requires 100% supervision at the very beginning of someone's training, cutting the tube on your mold? I, 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 let me tell you something. I think it will happen regardless of what we write here. I don't believe that any person who has an office and he has a sub-office like you will let a person replace a tube without teaching him how to do it because it's reflect on you. So I think it will happen anyway. There's front office people doing audio, audio testing right now in offices. So. That's that's yeah, that's we are tackling this. So and, uh, we are tackling the. Right yeah. There has to be I, 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 I yeah. Minor repair that does not include uh, adjusting the hearing aids. Uh, if somebody come and and the battery is dead and he put a new battery, <laughs> because the battery was dead, the customer didn't know. I mean, he should do it. That's that's not a license type. Activity, though, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. No, I mean, so do, I so do we need to maybe t uh, take time out to look at these, um, what these indirect requirements might be? I, I do want to, if I could just read uh, a definition of indirect supervision so we all know that we're talking mm -hmm. about the same thing. This is out of our slipper requirements. I know it doesn't 100% apply, but indirect supervision means that supervising speech language pathologist is not at the same facility or in close proximity to the slip up, but is available to provide supervision by electronic means. Indirect supervision activities performed by the supervi by supervisor may include, and then it goes on to talk about the type of supervision. Um, if, we, if we need to identify what those indirect tasks are, maybe we need to go back to having, um, you know, go back to the drawing board, get some specific input from people and come back at this next board meeting with some requirements. Mm -hmm. I, I do I, I do want to add one other thing, and that is that these these regulations are are extremely important. I think what um, Joe Bartlett just pointed out is a good point, and that is that when we write these, we're not writing them for the ideal, you know, best practitioners out there. We're we're writing them sometimes for those that maybe need some guidelines and some rules, so that they're not taking advantage of a uh, of some gaps that we might have. And we're trying to and we're trying to plug those holes. And I also wanted to mention that the entire concept of being a trainee and being a supervising hearing aid dispenser is completely voluntary to begin with. So to have people opt in to a on the job training program like this we think is critical and I think we're all on the same page that in any circumstance where a consumer could be at harm because of a contact that they could have with somebody who's not properly trained is at the forefront of what we want to accomplish here. Uh, but we also don't want to preclude people who might be cuspy from adopting a program in their own practices and potentially getting better as a result of that. So. I, I appreciate the discussion that we're having about some of the indirect um, duties here, and, and uh, we're, we're going to be happy to keep collaborating with you. Does this mean we're going to continue working on this, come up with a definition for indirect supervision and some, what would go, what regs would go under indirect? Is that what our objective is for next time? If we, if we choose to do that, we could talk about it now. We could uh, table it for another time. Um, I think it's up to the board to decide. Are we close? Comments from members of the board? I would like to see it defined. Mm -hmm. Because I think that in the interest of you know, some Friday afternoon at 4.30 trying to be nice, this person could step outside of the box. And if they have a box, they, they know, I could do this, I can't do that. 
and not uh, not do something to a patient or, or um, somebody who walks in the door. But I do see that as a possibility of happening. If it's clearly articulated, I'm fine with it. And as a board, if there's a ruling, it's yours in the long run. That they've yeah. followed the rules, so that's one thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're aware of that. I'm just and that's one thing they need to learn as well. <laughs> that's right. Follow the rules. Follow what rules. Is your right. <coughs> Let me ask you: uh, Is this item fall in the area of hearing aid dispensing, fitting, and selling hearing aids? Is this something a committee should do? Oh, this is also the, the committee does not do anything. Actually, anymore. the committee the committee did work on this in, uh, in a couple of when? meetings. Well, the most recent board meeting that you worked on it was in February. And then it went to the committee. Was it the committee? Yes. And we talked about the full board meeting last meeting as oh, well. Oh, I was not in the full board meeting last time. But you were in the no. committee meeting in February. That's when the committee talked about this. Both uh, both you and Marsha actually. On no, no, but we didn't talk about the issue of uh, defining what they were talking right now. The, but to answer your question whether this fits into yeah, the so board this, committee, it, it does yeah. and, and it did. We have, a, we have a couple options. One is to table it. You also made a suggestion earlier of yeah. just identifying that this does not include such and such. Right. And, you know, Marcia asked, are we close? You know, maybe we are close. Maybe this is something... If it's getting late right now and everyone's feeling a little weary, we could, yeah. we could possibly have time to look at this again tomorrow. Yeah, either tomorrow we'll do it in a committee and then the committee will come and, and the board will just up and down. And if we talk about it, if we have another, if we want to delegate it to a committee, then we have to notice it and yeah. talk about yeah. it later yeah. time. It would have to oh, be I see, I see, I if see. If we want to talk about it as a board, we so can let's, continue So let's finish it. Uh, this, this, so let's finish it. So is the issue about adding a third mm -hmm. category, the yes. indirect supervision, and what falls under that? Exactly. Is that where mm -hmm. we are? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So and, I, and if I understand correctly, um, defining a level of training that occurs prior to that. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. no. Third level. For, yeah. No, no. I don't think that we need the training to, to, to uh, official training by regulation to replace a battery or to cut a uh, tube or something like this. I, I think it should be exactly. I as well because yeah. I feel like adjusting a tube is, is adjusting the fitting itself. And I know that just as my own statute in my office is, even changing the length of a receiver, I do not let office staff do that. I, and this is, I'm testifying this, yeah. but if the receiver is the exact same length, the exact same power, everything exactly the same as I fit it, yeah. it can be put back on the hearing aid and given to the person and repaired in that. Case, but they cannot alter anything that I've changed in it because that would be changing the fitting. <coughs> Understanding an ear, an ear, an ear mold, um, cutting the tubing isn't, you know, there's some measurement involved, there's a placement of the hearing yeah, aid, right. um, there's learning how to stretch the tubing, there's several, several steps to it yeah. that somebody has to show you first. You don't you just walk in knowing you. how to yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that anybody, I mean, it's hard for me to believe that somebody will take a trainee and let him do this simple thing on an existing customer or a potential customer without telling him what to do. Because otherwise, and then, and if this trainee doing a lousy job, this customer will not be satisfied, but he will not be harmed. I mean, if I'm talking on BT, not on Rick. So if we cut the tube and it's too much hard on him or it's too long and it's falling out of his ear, it's not harming the consumer. The consumer will come again and complain about this, but it's harming the business. So I don't believe that somebody will not teach the person what to do. The point of having all of this is that you don't have to have faith in that. Huh? It actually yeah. can be written out for you, huh? that, that mm -hmm. there's rules. And, and I disagree completely because I've seen enough times in my own training that yeah. a tube was cut too short, and yeah. I had a consumer come back with a sore, <laughs> a physical sore in their ear, yeah, and they I were know. not allowed to wear a hearing aid while that sore healed. And no matter what you do to cut a tube at that point in time, that person now has no hearing in that ear. Yeah, so if we agree with this, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not so much opposed, we can add uh, that, and maybe we don't need to add it, as you said in the result, that direct supervision does not include clerical right. work. Right, if, it, if it's not the, the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids, then, then the supervision okay. is, is not apl applicable. Um, does that mean... Um, 
anything that's non-patient related? So there's no patient contact? Anything that falls in yeah, that category? I don't know. But what about battery replacement? I, my personal feeling is that you trained the, the person themselves to change their battery. So therefore, yeah, I know, but public record thing, anybody can change but a battery. You're doing a troubleshooting yeah. act. There's yeah. several, you're going to check that. You're going you to yeah. know how to operate a few right. things. Right. So, so if, a person, if a person come to the office and the trainee there, mm -hmm. and the person is right now at home, and he said the hearing aid is not working, and the person come and replace the battery. Is he allowed to? I think he's allowed to do it. I, I, I agree with you 100% that they would be allowed to change the, the battery. The battery. Because right. I, I almost see that as as clerical. It, yeah, it is, okay. Is that, at least that basic level. Um, there's now wax guard. I mean, there's all sorts of things now that. Oh, that yeah, there's wax guard. Things yeah, things wax guard that you can replace. Tiny, cl I think cleaning are things that okay. people can do. Cl you know, it's wiping, it's taking a, a, okay, a, a yeah. wipe that's. So that's, cleaning and. So can I just go back? Have we established then that we do want to define indirect supervision? Or to define or not to, or to have just the direct supervision with this does this except Okay, so this. it does not include certain things. So yes. do, do we can we come up with that list this afternoon? Yeah. I mean I think uh, cleaning is one, battery changing is two, and maybe uh, uh, presentation of Hearing it, maybe. Would we like to come back tomorrow with that list so that we? I mean, that, that I'd list love is to have show. To like, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, we can spitball all day long. Yeah. So if, if I might, writing these uh, down, uh, rather than tabling it to another <laughs> meeting, no, I think we, we can finish it. <laughs> so, so if I might um, add to that, that I think that if you do define an indirect supervision, then that certain things do not require supervision. <coughs> that there does need to be a training aspect that is specified, because um, I think part of the uh, the spirit of having a license is that you can do these things, and somebody completely untrained, just because they've applied for a temporary license and have a supervisor, they are now engaged in the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids, but they haven't passed any examinations and they haven't been, have no formal training. So for example, I could apply tomorrow and then do something that I have absolutely no experience with, but we say that somebody who, um, uh, you know, that has taken the practical examination, they mm -hmm. can't do it that until they have passed the practical examination um, and become completely licensed. So I think that there is some um, risk involved in, in not putting language in there that requires a training element. We do have language that says that training shall include all of these things and we have a, a long list. Um, but I think that if you're going to include an indirect supervision where it is the, the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids, that there needs to be an aspect of formal training prior to that indirect supervision coming into play. Because you wouldn't let somebody unlicensed do it. You wouldn't, you, we, we don't let people who haven't taken the practical examination and the written examination do these tasks. No, I, I, <coughs> I will let them clean the hearing aid, replace filter and battery. This I will. This does not require a test for these three tasks. But it requires training, so I understand your point. Delineating the training could be tricky. I would, yeah. I would also that, argue that those tasks could huh? be trained all the way down to a clerical person without any kind of yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, would, yeah, but I, I, because I don't want to criminalize people who are just sitting in the office and done this. And then, oh, they were not supervised. If, if That's those, all I'm trying to do. Let's put the, let's put the, just the hat on it for a second. Let's say those tasks were done incorrectly. Yeah. I don't believe there's any consumer harm at all if you don't put a battery in the hearing aid correctly. Maybe right. you break the hearing aid, but that's terrible. Yeah. And if you don't clean it correctly, again, I don't think unless we're dealing with like some crazy form of staff you don't know about, well, that you're going to have an issue. So I think those things are relegated down to a pretty minor level of, of danger. So, yeah, that's what I mean. But, but so the level of training for that, I don't think, I don't know that that even needs to be clarified into our no in law. So yeah, 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 I don't, I don't, I personally don't feel that. I've heard of a recent situation where someone put the wrong wax guard size on the end of a receiver, mm -hmm. uh, over and sold them those. Um, three of them came off in the ear. They had to go to an ENT. Were they harmed? You know, did it cause an infection? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But 
it, he could tell I could hear it would hear differently because between all the wax in his ears and his three um, uh, wax guards, you know, he had more trouble hearing. That's an interesting point because most of the time that's usually sold over the counter is like a replacement set of wax guards. So that would but be. But trainees could could m miss sell that or sure. miss choose it. You often, I know, again, that comes down to clerical for the practice that I work with because it's in someone's file electronically as to which type they're being sold. Um, it should but, be, but, but, but humans but are right. humans. And that's a whole other. That run, you run the risk of that you also run with, you know, again, a well fit earbud that's not maintained can come out in someone's ear by it making a beating. I've seen that happen. <laughs> so I'm agreeing with, with Kelsey about the uh, pre training, it's just delineating what that sh should be mm -hmm. is a little bit more difficult. Good point. It makes me think of changes I'd like to make in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Back to your task, Kelsey, what do you want? <laughs> It's, it's up to the board. So I'm waiting for the mm. I'm waiting for those items that we can come up with this afternoon. So right. we can <laughs> <laughs> my, my physical thoughts on ingress supervision would be um, again, like I've said before, and I will repeat myself. Whatever point in time is determined that indirect supervision can happen would be like a autoscopy, where you're looking down in the ear. You've been trained, you've been signed off on it, and now you're at a point of indirect supervision. Are we asking about indirect supervision from day one? What's a task? Or are we asking about indirect supervision throughout the process that we're writing here? Or I would both? not. I would not recommend an indirect supervision no. from day one. Yeah, um, I, I, that that would be my recommendation to the board because we require an examination to perform these services. Um, the legislature has determined that there are consumer protection issues. And so to say that you can apply for a temporary license and do these things without any sort of training, which the whole point of the temporary license is for training purposes, to say that you can do these tasks that have been delineated as professional license requirements, um, I, I would not recommend that. It's like the process of red, yellow, green. That doesn't, green doesn't start on top, it goes down that way. Yeah. So I would say otoscopy at that point in time. I would say retubing of hearing aids. I'd say, uh, uh, I'm going to say I, I just it. disagree with that right off the bat, okay, right. Uh, otoscopy. I think it takes, a, it takes a, a long time to be able to know what you're looking at, to spot a pathology, to recognize the, the need. I, I don't think you can, if it's 90 days or something like that, I just don't think that's enough. I don't agree with the 90 days, so I would be saying as someone would have to have the skill signed off that they appear to peer or trainer or some outside party, let's say, which we have these tests that are involved there, would have to say that person can do otoscopy, and then that is indirect. That's more. That's what my specific statement is. Well, I, I wouldn't put that in the same category with changing a tube. Right. I, okay. I do want to point out that per the last board discussion, a, um, otoscopic inspection of the ear um, was something that the board felt the supervising dispenser needed to provide immediate supervision any time that the training applicant is providing that service. Okay. So that was something that you had discussed last time. I just did want to point that out to you um, in going forward in this discussion that um, it was something that you didn't put a 90-day restriction on. You said that for mm -hmm. the entirety of the um, supervision, it needed to be immediate supervision. Um, <sighs> But again, my question is this then. My, I guess in my, the spirit of what I'm saying is more or less um, the immediate non medical type of otoscopy, not where you're not the beginning of a hearing test, but more or less uh, service based otoscopy. It, it, there's really no def definition, but if someone comes in and says, Is there something in my ear? and the supervising dispenser is not at the office, does that indirect supervision person have the opportunity to say, I see or I don't see something in your ear? you should still see your doctor if you're not sure, or I do see something, I mean, are those things that, is there a point in time where someone could have a simple, I don't see a full occlusion of ear wax in your ear, you know, I mean, those yeah, are. I think it's really hard to break down otoscopy um, for saying, if, well, for mm. these purposes you can do it, and for mm. these purposes you can't. I think that's really hard to delineate. So that might be not something that's in the indirect, it's more uh, the, f the full time that's there. Okay. The more of the retubing, the maintenance, I, I was about to argue some some hearing aid programming, but I know that there is it can kind of go both ways on that if it's a minor adjustment. But what's what defines a minor adjustment? Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'd love to write down the list and see, because I can't, I'm blank off the top of my head of all the things that we do <laughs> on a daily basis. But, um, and then it could be something where, yeah, that the debate obviously is, is, uh, is there. So. Is it the sense of the board that you would like to see a list that does describe, if you're going to use this third category of indirect, would you like to see what the list involves? Yes. Um, and I looked at the time. I don't think we'll get it tonight, but maybe we could do homework and bring it tomorrow and see if that's um, at least a beginning, but it, as well it's defined. I'll, I'll write down a list of tasks that I just know we do, and we can kind of decide on you know, what level it falls. Because again, stoplight, red, yellow, or green, you know, if that's something that does that so it seems like we've had this discussion before and we've kind of gone back and forth between saying you know the, the more explicitly we define something the we run into that trap of well if it's not explicitly defined then I can do it and that's just kind of the, the danger so but there's the danger yeah, that's true. and I will say from um, this isn't necessarily my um, role as your board attorney, but from the AG's perspective of if there were violations, how they would be able to plead these and be able to prove them up at a hearing in terms of your enforcement. Um, that's also something that we need to keep in mind. They need to be straightforward enough um, that uh, that they would be able to do their job on that on that front as well. So, and, and to your point, that um, there is a risk in, in creating lists because if it's not on the list, um, then and we've forgotten something or we want to move something on the list later on, um, it, do, it can create challenges um, in the regulatory field. Um, there is also a risk involved with being too general um, because then people can stretch your words yes. and um, take liberties with them. So. I think that this one in particular is going to be really hitting um, a, a happy medium and trying to find that balance between the two. Um, and I'm not sure. Is there a scope in the regulation that defines what the hearing a dispenser can do? So, Besides the general yes, uh, thing, fitting and yeah. selling. So it here. says, the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids as used in this article means those practices used for the purpose of selection and adaptation of hearing aids, including direct observation of the ear, testing of hearing in connection with fitting and selling of hearing aids, taking of ear mold impressions, fitting or sale of hearing aids, and any necessary post-fitting counseling. The practice of fitting or selling hearing aids does not include the act of concluding the transaction by a retail clerk. And then it goes on to talk about some other things. Um, a hearing aid dispenser shall not conduct diagnostic hearing tests when conducting tests in connection with the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids. Um, and the rest is not. So maybe we can write just the exception to direct supervision that the person can do anything that does not include in the scope of fitting and selling hearing aids. So that's how it's currently written. That's so written now? That's how it's it, it says the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids is it's only you only need supervision either direct or in or direct or immediate supervision if you are if the the temporary uh, trainee licensee is engaged in the practice of fitting or selling hearing aids. So if they're answering a phone call, someone doesn't need to be there. If they're scheduling, someone doesn't need to be there. And again, I don't. I don't have a list of what so, goes so on mean, in the hearing aid. So mean just because this, we don't have to put this exception? Uh, it's, it's up to the board. Um, I think that if there are certain functions um, where the board feels that either immediate or direct supervision is not necessary at a certain point in the training, then you would need to carve out an indirect supervision. Yeah, as, as we said, there's something like replacing a battery Routine Does, maintenance. Right. It's not included in a scope of fitting and selling hearing aids. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to list all these things. If we just list in direct supervision, uh, uh, 
this, this, and this, except for all other uh, tasks that does not include in the scope of bidding and selling here. Yeah. And so I think that's how, it, if I'm understanding what you're saying, I think that's how it's currently written. Well, there's it no says, exception, right? Well, no, it's, there's no exception because... So then would a category of indirect supervision be need to specifically be defined? I don't, I, I don't think so. If, if the board is saying that when you're doing tasks that are not within the scope of fitting or, and selling hearing aids, you do not need to be supervised. I don't think another category needs to be carved out because I think that is, uh, I think it's spelled out when you say that they need to be supervised either directly or, or immediately or directly um, when engaged in the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. Right. My concern is that we've, we've explicitly defined direct and immediate supervision, and that's great. Mm -hmm. However it is, we're gonna pick and choose the options. But then, if we're now going to pick, if we're now going to set up a laundry list for indirect. There, there, there is bound to be, uh, there's bound to be some uh, uh, confusion between the two, and we're going to have some problems with our licensees. Mm -hmm. So I think, though, if the if the laundry list is purely clerical. Or, or, or not the, the, the practice, yeah. not within the scope yeah. of a licensee, mm -hmm. then I don't think that we need to carve out that exception because it exists already. They, I, don't, they don't need to be supervised at that point. Not to, well, to correct, we, we are creating a laundry list on, down further in the section. Yes. This is just the definition of it. But when we actually start using the terminology, we're saying this is applied to this, 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 this. So, I, I believe that the definition, again, in this idea being created, and then if we have similar things that have happened, again, I, I, I'm beating a dead horse and saying, because I just want to clarify, I'm not saying at 90 days, I'm not saying that this is just something that people do at the beginning, but at a point in time where it, they, someone has shown the ability to do a skill, but they haven't completed their second test, let's say, because there's two of them to be done. Right now, and the reason I'm saying this, I think, is because I'm used to the current training method where you have a written test in the middle of it. And if someone passes that written test, they stay at tw only 20% required supervision, but if they fail that test, they go to 100% supervision. So in my, me in my methodology in the day-to-day -day usage, we, we make sure the person is very adequate and, and works well before they start taking that written test because it's, it's absolutely a detriment to have someone go to 100% supervision, 100% after they've been at 20 for a while, so the, the, the indirectness has made it so that that 20% supervision, the person has the ability to do certain things. Like, for example, an audiogram. Once they've been taught to do it, perform audiometric assessment without me sitting there next to them showing them how to push a button and, and work with that. But I need to look at the test afterwards. That's something that eventually should be an indirect throughout the full training to performing that audiogram, but not before someone's been signed off on that they can do an audiogram. So when it comes to that indirect supervision, that's I think what we're trying to figure out, what the definition would be, and then how it would be utilized th throughout the course of the training at the further aspects, which has, you know, it's, it's just whatever the writing and wordplay they have to do for that, so. Um. So I think, a couple things. I think we could carve out um, an indirect and just say that it applies when the person is performing functions that do not fall into the scope of practice. Um, I think to your um, point, um, when the board discussed it last time, um, it was that there needs it didn't it didn't need to be. I'm sitting with you performing this task after it was 90 days, and I understand that you have a have a call with 90 days, but um, it was only the a few tasks that they designated to be that immediate <coughs> supervision, you need to be sitting there with the person the entire time. And then as time goes on, 90 days, passing the examination, whatever the board determines, then those other tasks just require that you be available and physically present mm -hmm. at the location, mm -hmm. essentially. So, um, but what I think I'm hearing you say is that there are tasks that are you suggesting an indirect supervision for certain tasks 
um, it, that would be the third category. So we would carve out a list of things that after a certain point, um, the person would not need to be physically present at the location. That's, that's so it's a, it's a tell So it's a tele-supervision, which, mm -hmm. at, well, right? Is it I, it, I mean, yes, and, that, and that's the best way to form. Uh, or remote. So or there's remote, remote, right. But yeah, like if someone right. looked down someone's ear and said, I see something funny, they're calling and saying, I see something funny in this ear, what should I do? And right. that's where you go down the laundry list of training and say, whatever. But, mm -hmm. but so I, and, and even if it's the spirit of, of that, because it's been, and, and I, I can attest to like to HHP membership and many other people that have gone through training, is that there's times where you want, the whole point of really training people is so that you can grow and, and they can grow as a provider. Uh, and eventually they have to do it on their own, you know, without you looking down their throat and, and or look, sorry, whatever, breathing down their neck is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I, I believe that the spirit has to show that when someone has shown they have the skill, that's what, what we're determining, they should be able to do the task. Uh, whether they have a license yet, that's because of, again, we're waiting for practicums, we're waiting for this, we're waiting for that. You can't say the person has to be 100% supervised when they're both, everybody's both sitting there rolling their eyes in the room because the person is already said they can do it but they haven't got a license yet. After taking the practicum, there's a period before you know you passed the test. So you were obviously thought you were capable of taking the practicum. You don't know if you passed it or not, but that do you have to have someone supervising you now between the time you took your practicum and you learned your results? I mean, there's times where indirect supervision makes sense, but um, and if we're changing all of the time frames here and how things work, I guess that's just my kind of mindset I'm getting hung up on, but that's the spirit of what I'm describing and that is, at the point in time where someone has de determined that they have the skill, they should be able to do it without having someone uh, looking so down. So that's that's a departure from what the board mm -hmm. yeah. decided. Okay. So yeah, because I'm I think, speaking a different I think now you're putting it in the hands of licensees to yeah, determine right. when unlicensed people can do yeah. yes. licensee required work. Well, yeah. that's what the, the well again that's what the practicum and that's what the written test has been doing at this point in time as well. Is is a, it's, it's a board created test to say you past this point in time. I'm just saying to create But it's a legislative, well, it's a yeah. legislative required exam, and I think that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Joe, you're coming from a good place because mm -hmm. you probably run your practice a certain way, you mm -hmm. probably have a certain standard, mm -hmm. but I don't know that we can assure that everyone out there does right. the same thing. That's right. And that's well, what got us yeah. to this, is that discussion yeah. Yeah. about yeah. the person that's unsupervised 80% right. yeah. of the time. Right. It's looked to me that yeah. there's a lot of, we, we moving very wide, can we do it in two stages? Stage number one, very simple. 100% immediate supervision on ear mold impression. I will put this and then we'll deal with all, with all the rest. So that's already in there. Yeah, already. I know, I know, but I, can we, because if I don't wanna delay this thing because we are waiting to go and finalize all the other requirement for indirect cleaning and this well, and training. Well, I think the board has- So I wanna do this Immediately. Right. So I think the what it boils down to um, is that the board originally said that they did not want um, a sort of indirect remote supervision. So if the board has been persuaded and would like or would like to entertain that or would like to rethink that, then I think that it warrants further conversation. But if the board um, has decided that for this period of 18 months, or up to 18 months, um, that uh, those temporary licensee individuals should not be doing things that are within the scope of practice, unsupervised or supervised remotely, then, um, then we should work with this language and continue to move forward. But if, they, if, if the board um, is open to a remote supervision, then that would take, but, I think, a little bit more. Yeah, more, I know. You know so that's that. why I said it's very simple. I think mm -hmm. we can get to an agreement that an ear mold impression should be uh, immediate supervised category, and we do it right now, it's and then we deal with all the other things also. Oh, so I understand your... your so we still have to approve one of the, one version or another. Yeah, yeah it's, it still has to be, be approved, and I think that... Um, Uh, yeah, that's a, a policy call as to how you want to break up your regulation packages. Yeah. Um, just knowing that 
regulations can take a really long time. So even if you want to do this immediately, yeah. spending the extra time to, to finalize it, to make it the way that you want it, um, maybe in your best interest, because it may not be for a few years until you can make it how you want it. The final version, I guess. So you mean you want to wait one more cycle what, until February in yes. order to decide for the language? That, that's up to all of you. Yeah, that's a I, I have no. I, so I really like the statement about the finding the sweet spot, um, about being too specific or not specific mm -hmm. enough. Because for one thing, um, technology changes, and technology changes a great deal in, in hearing aid dispensing, and there might be um, new procedures that that come up and if we get too specific about everything then we've cut out the possibility of the role of technology in hearing aid dispensing on the other hand we want to be um, specific enough so that the average or subpar average business owner of hearing aid dispensers must meet some minimal requirements so I think the whole idea of that sweet spot is very yeah. important but I'd like to see us get this done tomorrow yeah. uh, I am completely against indirect supervision at, at this particular um, okay might I make a suggestion <laughs> there's gonna be a time where we will have a break because you will be deliberating during that time we can condense this put together one right. document oh, and then we'll yeah. bring it back and we'll talk about it in the afternoon yeah I, 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 one more respect in, in yeah. a couple of years we're gonna have the over-the-counter and everybody will be able to do it without the license a lot of tasks that we are now prohibiting and what's happened is that the person in Walmart will be allowed to do something that my trainee is not allowed to do well so, that's so what I, they're not licensed so, so our, I, our concern is about our license what, what I will ask, and I know this is a this is a, a you know kind of a big ask, but anybody that has anything that they want to contribute to that conversation, provide it to us, and then um and then we'll go back and we'll try to condense, put something together, and bring it back to the board meeting. It may be based just on this document, but at least we'll have time to kind of mm -hmm. digest things a little bit mm -hmm. and come back tomorrow. And yeah. I'm sure your minds will be fresh after yeah. considering all those disciplinary yeah. issues. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are adjourned. Oh, are we adjourned?